Okay, good morning, everybody. So um, just maybe to sort of level set our conversation for the day. We have no idea the timeline, how this will all work together. It all depends on, I think, input from you. We, we actually have a have a safe word amongst our team so that if I if I get too far into the weeds that that you'll have to see if you can guess what it is. <laughs> um, so, so sort of back ourselves out of it. So I thought we thought that we would start off with just sort of a reminder of the, that change management. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi, Cheryl. She come off me. Cheryl, did you have something for us? I'm not even showing that I have my hand up, so I'm not okay. sure. No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> I, you're, you're not on my screen either <laughs> because all I can see is this. So um, please let me know if, if there are questions that I can't see, guys, because um, I definitely don't want to miss the folks folks in the background. So, um, But I guess, Cheryl, perfect timing. How's our sound? Good? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, awesome. So, um, so we thought we would sort of start off just with this conversation about about the change management process for integration, and we worked on this last year with with Rochelle's team, um, in 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 sort of working with the community with what would be the best as far as timing. And I think we heard really loud and clear last fall at the at the fall summit that having <laughs> Elise is smiling, having having um, the plan not complete or maybe as widely known um, as far as the next version until the fall is just setting everyone up for failure. And so um, took that took that to heart and we made the commitment to have a very rough plan. And and I if you hopefully you all received it in an email last week, we tried to get it out. Um, so you had had some time to look it over before this meeting. So we have full expectations that you'll have the exact costs and the time and the lift for each item for your team. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so clearly that that's not the case. We, we were thinking that um, we get it out before folks could have a chance to review and, and have some thoughts before before we came we came to this meeting. Um, during this meeting, we thought we'd go over it and get a real clear picture of yes, this is critical for the next version. Here's what here's what we as the Irwin team have been given as our priorities. Um, for for the next version that we could that we could share and that may help you understand where we're coming from with, with some of those things. Um, and then get that finalized in the next month. You know, and when I say finalized, th these are the list, right? So that you know and moving into your coding season, you've got a real clear expectation. And then we also talked about <clears throat> more of a, a follow-up check-in process specific to to issues that we know that can be a challenge you know currently Irwin does um well, they host they facilitate i would say um tech tech talks every wednesday and they're historically have been really geared towards resources because that's what was our big issue you know trying trying to get forward and, and work with those those systems so that might morph into sort of a you know, hey, we're, we're working with Woftus on this right now, so so we'll we'll focus on this, or just just maybe more close relationship as we move forward to, for our success. So um, what I, what I thought we'd do is maybe just edit edit this as well because I think, and I and I look for input. Is this is this timing? I know it's going to help, but is this the gold standard? Do we still need to look for something better? And I always look to Beth because no, I think this is good. Yeah, you can't you can plan too far. Today. Yeah. Exactly. And then I just know, I mean, I, I always talk to Julie and I hear about, man, you know, we've already planned out for this. We've already planned out. We've already planned out for this on the IROC side. I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to mess with them. We're coming in with, with stuff too late. So we're just trying but to get stuff. We also usually, you know, like plan for her. Like, yeah. Like we don't always know what the plan is. <laughs> but we don't ignore <laughs> well, well, we'll we'll try. We'll, we'll try to, to, to be um, clear with our plan for sure. So what I thought I would start with, well. Before we get too far, yeah, I yeah. think Chris Buzo is on the line and wanted to give a few words before we get started, just to kind of set off the Irwin discussions as the program manager <coughs> over Irwin and our team. Yes, please. So Chris, the line is yours. Yeah, good morning. Thanks, everybody. Sorry, I couldn't be there. 
but I am, you are in capable hands with Brandon and Kara and excited to have Kara leading, help leading from the business perspective, moving this forward. So everything she said um, to this point, I have never heard before and completely disagree with. So <laughs> we'll, we'll be talking about this when she gets back next week. Um, <laughs> Hitting. Um, no, look, looking forward to at, you know, on the heels of successful version eight deployment, making sure that we are fully communicating and widely communicating, right? That's the key for all of this, where we are, what we, what we need to be able to move forward with and being mindful of the other applications and systems um, that have coding requirements as well, so that we're not trying to make this a system of systems that includes everything all at once. Um, so, you know, as we've been as we've been talking through this week, you know, I, I think it's becoming clear that you know Irwin is a is a big piece of where this is going with the data environment, um, but it may not necessarily be um, the whole enchilada or even as significant as we think it may be. Um, so we want to be mindful of of how all of these pieces continue to move forward and evolve um, as we you know, push this program forward, as well as um, as we continue in our what almost 10th year of Irwin employment, um, really getting back into that um, asthma check that Brandon had started last year and looking at how we can be more efficient and effective with our uh, data integration. So with that, I will shush up and let Kara dive back into the weeds again. <laughs> you don't get to hear the word yet. I know you just wanted to hear it. Um, Don. She's not sharing. I see. I see it. You do see it? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's on, it's on my issue. I was looking at, the, at that back there and I was like, it's not sharing. Oh, you yes, see? because because I'm logged in in both. And so uh, it's like, this is me. Okay, so but, it's sharing in the meeting, but it's not on the... Oh, because yes, we're not plugged in? Yes. Stand by. No, we are. Wait for it. I always, I'm always so confident when I see Don and Greg in the room because I'm like, if I get in trouble, technology wise, <laughs> he can just fix it for me. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So when we sent this out last week, I my phone immediately lit up, which made me super happy with folks who had thoughts um, uh, and input and things that we may have missed that wanted to add. So this this has been adjusted a little bit for some of those things so far. And as we work through it today, we'll be keeping notes in it and we'll see how well that works for me. Um, taking notes and talking in a microphone and standing is like running with scissors. So we'll see if I can how I can handle that. Um, but uh, but but we'll keep updating as we as we go. So Brandon, we just want to start right off. We'll dive right in. Yep. OK. Um, so, um, our, our highest, our highest importance, our, I'm looking right at you, sister, <laughs> um, the, the, as we, we, we started to adopt using JIRA with, with, um, with the Irwin team, which is great because we're, we're now combing through all of these, uh, these items within that system. And so Mary was just able to export it for us into this wonderful document that we could, that we could speak from. So. Pardon any grammatical errors, anything like that that's within it right now. It was it was rough and it was almost intended to be that way so that folks could just weigh in. So for so for us and, and we've heard loud and clear from the community for, for the last for the last year that that there is a critical need to, to get the reintegration of the final fire reporting system data back into the, the Irwin data set. Um, and so you know we, we're continuing to look for opportunities to do that. Um, there, you'll see that we have a little note of, of right now, kind of could, there's three options that we're, we're thinking of. I feel, I feel the word coming. Um, and, uh, and I'm not supposed to go too much further in that because we're, we're going to have to just wait and wait and see what that looks like, but that, that will be the priority. And, um, our, our plan is to get together as a team in person to meet, to draw out some of these technical, technical solutions, technical possibilities to put forward to the community of this is what we think we can do. And then the, the big thing during those conversations is 
What does that mean? People are laughing. <laughs> That's okay. We've got this. We can do this. Um, I think that, uh, Mary, there, there's some table options or some conversations behind the scenes that they've that they've sort of explored explored and looked for um, with service with with actual reintegration and then come together with three options that we would yeah. present to the team Go and ahead. it's important to note when we talk about the three options really these three options shouldn't impact the broader community it's going to be back-end development on Irwin with coordination from inform team so uh, reintegrating the data should really only affect for a development standpoint, should really only affect those two applications, Irwin and Inform, right. uh, where you guys as the broader community should just get the data like you used to have it prior to Inform uh, going into its standalone format that it went to last year. And I think that part of this you'll notice is on our list, some ADS permission state discussions. Um, that that part, would, again, not a lift for you, just it would be a conversation of, how that was set up previously is that still meeting your needs do we need to reevaluate what what specific data elements um do, do we need to reevaluate go ahead mary <laughs> oh i was just going to say I, I think there's a couple of things we identified that that may uh, depending on if you want that information that may impact other applications um and i think trying to have it on several screens here but like the if we integrate like the fodder yeah. as a data element and you want to consume that, that would be, you know, technical lift for the applications that want that information. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there, I don't know, I guess, I guess we're still trying to evaluate that lift for the extended teams, but. Um, and, and even a phased implementation, right? So, so one of the things that was identified from the task group that got together is, is the need to have the fodder, right? Is, is, is a possible need to have the fodder and especially in terms of here I go, but especially in terms of when the work that's done on the inform side with the fodder and the related relationships that may not have happened within the, the operational system, um, making that transition to come back in and how those notifications would go to those systems, right? And so the, the, the real key is, is having it in the background, but they identified um, you know, listening to folks like Gina Papke and, and Julie and, and a bunch of the, the, the dispatch system as far as being able to see the fodder and have it not in the guts of an application, but like on a resource order or in a WFTIS decision or something like that. We know that that is an additional lift and Cole brought that up once when we were chatting about it too. And, and is that critical for this next piece? Probably not. We could phase that in later. Those are those things that will work your thinking. Yeah, that's okay. So those are those are those things to Mary's point. We we know that there would be a, a lift associated with it, but but we're we're looking for ways to implement that kind of a lift in a in a more gentler, kinder, kinder way. You know, subs talk through it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that was just my point. And I think the other thing that we had talked about um, as a team is just like how high priority the the final fire reporting or the fire reporting data is yeah that that's why it's like the highest and, and that's probably going to be like all of our effort yeah. trying to get stuff out you know earlier and you know get that stuff more settled or, or yeah at least this stuff worked out internally um, from the early teams and, and i would say see if i say it out loud we're, we're committed um i would say that um those Irwin extended team calls, we plan to have, you know, updates and discussions on those, our progress to keep folks in the loop on this is more, probably more than the past in the more recent history. So really we'll be looking for folks to jump onto those calls, but we also think that we'll be reaching out to individual systems individually and have those kinds of conversations um, <clears throat> just to make sure we're all on the same page and that we didn't notice an impact that you've noticed and vice versa. So. So Mary was right on as far as, you know, we, we started talking about it. This this first bullet, I'm down to the second one with the fodder. Um, you know, the, the, the clear workflows, every everything that's in this highest are all somehow related to getting that data back. Do you have another, another one? 
no, okay. I, I, I guess the only thing is that, you know, if there's discussion or thoughts, I, I know we're very much a yay on this, but I, I don't know. If that... Thoughts from the room, from, from the phone. Um, you know, the, the, the incident relationship piece. Um, I'm going to go ahead and see how well I can switch gears here. So we have done a, quite a bit of work on Rochelle asked us to work on a, on a standard for, for relationships and, um, and conflict detection and conflict resolution. And, and it was something that I really struggled with because it really overlaps itself in so many different places and where one ends and the other begins is, 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 is sort of a challenge. So, and it's also sort of a weird standard because right now it's in pictures. Um, but with, with all of that being said, we have, um, <clears throat> a, a lot of it is, is written from, we can grab from other, other application specs as to how they've looked at it, from the Irwin specs as to how we've looked at it. So we're trying to make it as a as um, collectively accessible and, and, and um, implementable uh, for, for everyone. So you can see where we talk about, you know, incident complex relationships. Um, we were, we asked for a little bit more clarity as far as, you know, who makes the relationship created by system creates the incident record in this in this instance? Um, the prescribed escaped relationship is another one that we've been talking quite a bit about, and Irwin Irwin um, coded for it this year. Uh, some of the other systems were like we we just couldn't yet, so the structure is there for them to to bring in. This is a big lift. This lift came from pretty on high, literally the White House. Um, to, to be able to to show this information, so you can see where we've we've drawn what that what that will look like and some language that's associated with it. Is this what you were hoping for? Okay, good. Whew. This is what I was nervous about. Now I'm all good. <laughs> um, no, Karen, this is not acceptable. <laughs> so then we move back on, on the merge relationships. The same. Uh, this this had all just sort of like I said been pulled in so many different places. Some in lucid charts, some in language and some with different applications. So, so you'll see we added those. This one is really interesting and I and I sort of stopped where we've got the potential conflict. This probably is maybe an, a newer concept. Um, we had this a couple years ago and we sort of lost it um, in, in recent history with some of our applications where we were all identifying the potential conflict in, in very similar ways, not exactly the same. You know, some of um, some of the systems had had added some some more creativity, and I always look to inform because I really like the way that they implemented some of their conflict detection. Um, so added worked with them on the phone a little bit with some of the stuff that they they've done. Um, talked and started to socialize with the community and the operational side about if we could possibly be ready um, to reevaluate how we do our conflict detection. Um, Historic. What what's what's right here, and I hope you can see that okay. But um, some of the language that's in there. Um, is how we had done it historically, and we were looking to add some some additional things like name, um, and uh, to, to to sort of catch more of them during the operational phase than we had uh, historically. Um, when we start to move from that that uh, conflict detection to the providing response to, um, where where we've where we've uh, it's very similar, but then as far as who changes. Who changes the the incident record uh, to to an OR um, and the work that needs to be done by the individual systems because that was the ask that the systems asked for. Sorry, there's some late notes that I stuck in there, but the one that that is new is this providing response to conflict detection parameters are not met, right? And so there is a need from the community. I see Don nodding, so that's really good. Um, there's a need from the community when we don't trigger those conflict detections to be able to resolve it. I was just going to say, I think just overall, there's a couple of things that maybe impact the community with this incident relationships thing. Um, one being what you were talking about, where um, you know, providing the providing response to a relationship and how that um, connects an OR to you know a wildfire or you know, however that's uh, put together. Um, I think where the lift is there is, you know, the conflict detection is not triggered. So 
it's in I've been the, saying this for so long. Right. I love that you. <laughs> so, so at this point, you know, down the line, somebody says, "Oh, actually, this is an OR. I need to go back now and make that connection so I can, you know, do my reporting do X, Y, Z." Yeah. Um, and I think that there may be some applications out there that do provide this um, as a. a as an option in their interface, it, there's nothing in Irwin necessarily that's preventing somebody from right. doing that at this point. So, you know, development wise, in terms of things that would change from the Irwin perspective, uh, in, in that aspect, there, there's not a whole lot. Yeah. But I think from um, where, where our left is, is maybe getting that business rule or the flow defined so that folks can, can code to that. Um, and I know that that's not um, that's not just for the providing response to a relationship. I think the prescribed escape also kind of qualifies for that. Yeah. Um, and where there are kind of uh, we, we've previously defined a lot of Irwin relationships in, in, in the lens of like complex merge and then everything else kind of this conflict detection. Yeah. Um, thing and I think we're starting to branch out and um, and some of the post fire, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. So I, I think fire. that's where the lift for applications lies is coding to allow a user to um, use these relationships yeah. outside of conflict detection, um, and then also I think just us trying to land some of these business flows uh, for like your post fire, which we had, we had kind of proposed in version eight and I pushed it to future and now we're in future. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and any other ones that may be like that financial piece. Yeah. Things like that. So um, I don't know if there needs to be like a, a yay, a future on having folks come to that OR piece. Would you have um, a question on what oh. OR, FR, and BR means? Oh, okay. So, um, so, so the so the OR right has been an NWCG event kind category, the out of area response. Um, Kara's quick definition is: um, we have a smoke report. Uh, one dispatch fire response area sends a response, but but their neighboring center got the same report, so they're sending a report as well. Um, there'd been some some issues uh, historically where you needed to get a fire code, launch aircraft, et cetera. So in order to do so, folks were pushing their incidents into Irwin, right? And so they were having, and this is before Irwin, and I think about a call that Rochelle and I had years and years ago, I couldn't tell the still at the neck, right? Um, and so when that happens, it was a it was originally set up as, as a conflict detection resolution. I have to tell you though, in my mind, it was actually sort of a way to capture all response under one record at the time. And so it actually is kind of a win win. And um, so what happens currently is now the resources get on scene and, you know, it's 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 areas A is actual response. The point of origin is on there and area B, it is not theirs. And so how we've solved for it thus far is the relationship is built and during that relationship in the order of operations is um that or incident becomes an or incident but it also becomes invalid so that is probably something to mary that that we've had some requests recently about why are we making that invalid and i, I think our question we, we worked for a few hours last night and talked about this to our question and i'm looking at you tim our question about this one is why do you want it valid um we 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 agree we we think that there is there is some um, um, logic behind leaving it as a as a valid record, but um, since the incident type is an OR, that there would be some some rules behind that, right? And so, if folks are wanting it to remain valid to order off of, that's probably not the right call here. If they're wanting it to remain valid, because yes, we had folks respond and it was a valid response, then that definitely makes sense. Yeah, Kara. Yeah. yeah. As Tim um, talking about the is valid piece, um, some places you may end up dumping, you know, return on a fire, return to base, 
and then later on in the next 12 hours realize that someone else is and go oh that's your incident you know now i'm an or how do i bill um air tanker time to an invalid incident and and, and since it was a measure it was a calculated response for threat or for whatever reason right so you needed to go ahead and do that and then associating that response to the valid incident and then also tim do do we run into any challenges where the actual incidents response was well i would not have ordered that expensive response is, is that part of the issue too you cut out Kara on my end oh shoot um, I was saying maybe that maybe Tim uh, can answer that question. <laughs> I can hear you either. You can hear me either. No. Oh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, remember. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> it's like this is a really weird feeling that you're talking. <laughs> Nobody can hear you, <laughs> and, and your mouth is just moving. <laughs> Yeah, anybody else? <laughs> so um, what I asked Tim was if if there was that, so he was saying, Tim Bozar said that part of the issue is that, that they've had a response, that they've they've dropped your target, for example, on that OR incident and it was it was a valid response, but now it's somebody else's fire. How do they go about handling the billing if there's if it's not an active record? Um, and in our in our minds was well it's related to the other and that that tells you but um it just had sort of some questions behind why we want it valid is the or in the relationship enough so i it's tim and i have talked about this at, at length I, our perspective is that both incidents are valid mm -hmm. but and, and we alleviate the concern of the one ignition, one incident issue by make changing the incident type. Yeah, agreed. Um, both of them are valid incidents. And from my perspective, when we're talking about an invalid incident, it was somebody had an oops and shouldn't have created the incident. That's when that should be invalid. Should, the incident should be invalid. Which is really more of a duplicate. Just an avoided incident. I don't even want to say duplicate because it could have been a duplicate. Yeah. Okay. But even duplicates are valid on their face. Yeah. And right. sure. the way that we quantify that for the statistics and the bean counters is by changing it to a log. Yes. So are we is OR are we making ORs invalid? We are, and we have been. We have well, for the question. If my memory serves, the system doesn't do it, but our business processes defined it as you change it to an OR and then invalidate. And, and, it, and I think part of the original thought was one valid record per ignition. I think that the relationship, I, I, I guess I would just agree with, with, with some of the argument that, that, that Tim has said, and I'd be really interested to hear from, from the IROC folks too, but it's changed from a into event category to an OR says it all. I look right. at I look at Gabriella because this is something that I really appreciate your insight into as well. Um, so I, I think we're open, right, to community consensus to to leaving it as a valid. The relationship is built. The systems like 209 would not look for an OR, so you wouldn't care. That wouldn't impact you. Yep, Megan's saying no, that's okay. And I think that would be the coding change there, right? I think, you know, a lot of, uh, because we were setting them to invalid, okay, that automatically gets filtered out by my query that says is valid true. Now it has to be, you know, I, I also don't want, you know, incident type kind or, or type, I, I forget which one it is, that is equal to OR. Um, so that would be- Your query. Yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want those showing up and they are valid, you know, that that is the, you know, hey, if we make that change, applications need that awareness. Yeah. So that and would you just put that in the language on the spec to sort of oh, folks through? Yeah, mm -hmm. it would definitely be something we have in the spec, probably in our release notes. I mean, and, and things we would have to test for. But, sure. But mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And okay. I think that's where I think we wanted to reduce the awareness of that level of effort um, even if you don't create ORs but if you read in 
those things that that. Yeah, if you read yeah. on valid, go ahead. Right. Oh, no, I was just going to say Steve has a question. Oh, OK, and I think Julie, the, sorry, can I? Just to say, it seems like they should be valid in a sense. They were at one point. Just go to inactive, but you can't take any action on it. Inactive for IROC OR, and that's is would that would that trigger trigger in to inactive for you? You could make it that way. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to read Steve's question? Yes, please. So invalid in Irwin means not a valid incident wildfire occurrence record question mark. The other surely is a valid classification of workload response event. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I think Steve, you know, for years we've talked about is the fire on me versus I responded to a fire on somebody else, right? And I and this is really trying to pull apart that we've got workload and we've got an ignition, right? But that's I, I think we in making an OR invalid, we conflated the record with the incident. Yeah. And and we need to be clear that that a OR record is still valid. Agreed. It's just not valid as the primary wildfire Agreed. record. And so, so I, I really want us to look at making ORs valid because at the end of the day, what we want to be able to do is understand the entire story of the incident. And if there were three responses to it initially, we want to know that exactly. and account for that. And making those our ORs invalid uh, implies that they're not important and they are right no and I, I would agree with you and, and I think that we were able to see that in the relationship but this will make it clearer by saying that they're valid so I, I'm going to take that as a consensus to go ahead and start to do some work um, on that Mary yeah, hey Kara have a problem with it yeah <laughs> hey Kara it's Tim again hey so to further that point you just said that it's in the relationship that whole logic piece is broke. Um, the all the specifications uh, specify B is either um, the winner or loser, and it never identifies A dispatch the first in as ever a loser. And when A is that loser, there's no specifications on who establishes a new relationship. So for the know. OR and how and who does it, how it happens, when it happens. And so you don't have that relationship anymore. Did that go? Is that a medium? I, I think it's in low and lowest only yeah. because it was like, okay, we're, we're going to have this conversation. And I think honestly, a lot of what Tim is saying is it, it's kind of what it, it's kind of encompassed by this idea of creating relationships outside of conflict detection. Right? That's exactly it. And and I think I, that was that was one of the things that, and I don't know, Tim, if, if I was cutting out during that part when we talked about the relationships where the, the conflicts weren't triggered, and that in our minds is very similar logic to how we're gonna fix when B wins. And that has been an issue. I look at Gabriella because even even Rochelle, right? That's been that's been a concern for us for a while. So um We'll continue. We'll, we'll. Yeah, I don't know if there's necessarily a need for like a. There may or may not be a technological lift on that, but it's certainly business. a lift of a business conversation and getting something written down. Or, or I think that. Tim has Tim's written up something, hasn't he? Talk to Don first. Talk to. Well, <laughs> I was just going to ask in in your standards, do we have any relationships? that are mutually exclusive and can they have more than one? Uh, I see a couple of examples where they could. Complex and merge, for example, yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but I didn't know, are there any that it can't be both of these? We, there's, a, there's a, you can't be. Can't be in two complexes at the same, same time. time. But that's the same relationship type. So as long as it's, so are you saying, so if we have like, like, two ORs for one WF? Something like that. Um, I, I'm just trying to think. I don't think I had it. Have multiple, some of have these, multiple relationships. Yeah, some of these are kind of prevented by the nature of the incident record. Like if we go forward with the post-fire relationship, you have to be like, 
the wildfire would have to be the parents and you'd have to be a BR or an FR, a bear or a fire rehabilitation. Yeah. You know, what those are defined. So like some of that, and I think we, we've started to break down a little bit of our pro matrix um, on some of that just because it is complicated. Um, so I guess maybe yes and no, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, but maybe that's a good business question too. Are there things that we should be to not allow? Just, just something maybe to call out. Yeah. Did you write? It once down? we think. Yeah. Think through all that. Yeah. Did somebody? Did somebody on the? Did you say somebody out here had their hand up too? Same person in the back. Yeah. All right. So the the other question that that I want to throw out here and this is. <laughs> going to cause people's heads to spin around, I think. Should I sit down? <laughs> it is the um, concept of a, um, an OR to another incident, to an incident for an agency that doesn't do anything in Irwin, I rock anything like that. So I'm thinking of like um, the city of San Diego or something like that where they're not an IROC player <coughs> they had no way of getting that incident in other than a cal fire incident number well they would in theory come in i'm looking at julie they would in theory come in in the bulk upload and that's part of i guess we should document that one mary that's part of i think we've when we have thought about bringing in the data back from 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 inform seeing the Irwin IDs that are associated with them. So those ones obviously don't get an Irwin ID. But if, for example, you had one come in that, oh, here's its actual fodder, how do you make that relationship? Do you have, is that, and I, I might not be saying this right. So say it came in from Minnesota, the state of Minnesota already, and then it came in from the bulk upload there's a relationship there right that, that you have that record but without it i only know how you make that relationship table with the irwin id so when an irwin id doesn't exist how, would that just get wiped out yeah, in your initial to, an irwin thing? To, inform. to inform yeah yeah that was yeah it will okay so the minnesota one came in let's just say also from inspector and it and it has a an Irwin ID and a fodder ID. And then another one comes in and it doesn't we don't see it, like the Irwin side doesn't see it because it came in from the bulk upload. And both into inform. Both into inform. And they both have fodder ID. They do. And they're the, you're talking they're the same incident or they're they're, they're the same. same. They're the same. Yep. But our conflict detection would get those okay. and designate them as such as being like disability and all that right. kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Through names, location, all that stuff. And it's in your table, so though. Have a fodder ID, and then the user could splice them, and then they would have that relationship. So, in his example, so say you know San Diego, there was something that had already made it through all the other operational systems, and, and had come into the final, and then some. They would bulk upload it. I'm looking for Keith Smith. He's not there, but they would bulk upload it. The San I'm Diego. here to help too. I came Thank in late. DJ. <laughs> I was starting to sweat. I was waiting to hear your voice. <laughs> Hence, I said the word Minnesota. <laughs> I was channeling you to come and talk. I, I, I guess my point is, it's yeah. a local government agency that is not a integrated player in anything. Yeah. That's an incident. So I might be living in a dream world. I thought all of those were now being included in bulk uploads because that was part of their. But I think he's asking, does he keep his as a wildfire or oh. come in form? It would be an OR because you're butting up against something. DJ? The original one. I, I, it was tough to hear that last element that Don. Say, could you say it again? Cause I don't think I can. Yeah. Uh, We're gonna we're gonna get you. Uh, I was gonna say throw it at that. Uh, yeah. Don't throw. Don't throw. Don't throw. I know better. <laughs> I'm just talking closer to the mic right here, BJ. That's but, okay. Uh, so I I think what what we're hearing is do we for the the integrated 
uh, incident that it came through as a wildfire, but it is it is secondary. It is butting up against that state one that is just getting in the bulk upload. At that point, would when you're splicing it and in form, does that original integrated one become an OR? Because it is, it's the secondary one. And my initial answer is no, because the form doesn't do that. It makes the table, right? The relation. No. So, okay. so the 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 splicing and the resolution capabilities within Inform allows the um, individual certifying both those records and making sure all the data is nice and clean. Um, they are allowed to pick which one is going to be the winner and which one would be the loser if they are true duplicates and there isn't a need to put an OR on the other record, um, then the other one is just classified as a root record to the fire occurrence record. So essentially it's a child to that fire occurrence record and only that fodder would get passed back or should be read from. So we, in inform with the bulk upload and the data that comes in, we do pick a winner and a loser. We're saying that this is the record that people should be using. This one is a child or a root of that main branch. So that's how that works. So in the case of, say, a fire that is not in the inform environment or the Irwin environment, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's just going to sit into, it's just going to sit in the NFERS data, the national data, until somebody requests it and puts it somewhere, right? Oh. The opportunity to bring that in through bulk upload or Karen Short's fire occurrence data set, the FOD, um, is there, and that's what we're looking one of the user stories we're going to use in the next set is to back populate using the FOD to get a majority of the data um, that's out there and, and, and have it available for viewing and everything like that. That said, um, there's going to be holes that are going to have to get filled in by local agencies to ensure that they have a complete data set and that can be done via bulk upload. Um, there probably are going to be duplicates there that are going to then become roots to the main record, whichever one is determined to be the most accurate by, again, the human eyes on the system. Um, and then the, the last, I guess, bit here is that if something just hangs out there and never gets loaded into a data set, um, you know, it, it's going to be a hole that really it's going to be the local unit government and the communication between the agencies to make sure that that it's getting filled in i would say that we don't assign um how can i put it this way um we aren't going to assign an or to a record that is in that splice process if there's a record that so we're we're really concerned about wildfires so if somebody really wants their record to be in the environment um, because there is something like, yeah, they dropped a tanker drop on it and then now they got to figure out the billing and everything, it's really going to be incumbent on the agency that did the actual work and knows about the work being done to get those into the system, whichever one it is, as an OR. Does that make sense? Yes. It does, and it, I guess it also just really speaks to the need to be able to build those relationships when we don't trigger. I just, I think that, yeah. I'm, does it does inform ingest ORs? Did you hear she asked if inform ingest ORs? Um, we can see them. If we turn it on, we can see all the records that come through Irwin. Yeah. Um, we don't do anything generally with them unless they're uh, potentially, again, after the whole, whole operational period is done, we, we might look to make them a spliced record. The other yeah. caveat that Inform does is that we don't invalidate any record that comes from an outside system. 
yeah. we only we only have the ability to invalidate records that are from within inform so from that standpoint if ors are in the system and they do get spliced to a wildfire they do not lose their Irwin id they do not get tagged as invalid they, they don't do anything they just get basically attached as an appendix to that main wildfire record are they coming in because they're invalid came in originally probably because they're wildfires, right, PJ? Before yeah, they so come. it would, so ideally the process is that they would have come um, in as a wildfire, uh, looking at it, somebody says, oh, we got to go to the originating system, and this really should be a out of area response, change it in the originating system, we'll see it as an OR, and it's fine. I mean, we don't, like I said, we aren't invalidating any of the data that comes from Irwin. We are just saying, hey, this is the package that really tells a story about the events that occurred on that wildfire. Yeah, I, you just made me think to, you know, just to be really, really clear, especially for the person who, who raised their hand and said, what's an OR and what's an FR? Was it? <laughs> Auto area response, yeah. No, yeah. I know. I just, yeah. I just meant that... Um, the incident category, the event category is an OR. The relationship is providing response to. And I think some of those things we've been talking about with, with California and in other areas, specifically about this capturing the providing response. Yep. Keep thinking there's a, there's another event category that, that needs to lock in there. We've been talking a lot about, you know, the the uh, the bear. The burned area restoration, right? The the um, FR, the the uh, fire rehabilitation, and then this. We've had a lot of conversations recently with with like I was just saying with California about um, they have. It is suppression repair that is specific to the jurisdictional agency, not the protecting agency. And it feels really similar to some of the post fire, but it's not necessarily the same. And it's really providing response to a relationship that might need another category. So, and one thing I was going to offer um, was that, oh, and I lost it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Brandon can clear, but I haven't said anything that you're not familiar with, right, Brandon? It all makes sense what I babbled about. Correct. <laughs> oh, I know what I was going to say. So one thing I've noticed already this season, dispatch centers are putting in pre-suppression, pre-position orders as wildfires. When I see those in Irwin, I'm like, oh, Minnesota has a half dozen fires already occurring when we're snow covered. Now we aren't anymore. We're in red flags today. Um, but what I do and what is the right thing to do is then call that dispatch center up that put that pre-suppression order in and say, hey, you put that in as a wildfire, you need to fix it. And then they go in, they switch in IROC from it being a defaulted wildfire to a, a pre-suppression or pre-position, and then boom, it comes in, it gets readjusted as such labeled as such and it drops off our map unless we turn that filter on. So that, that that's essentially the process that really needs to happen is that when somebody sees something odd, call the other entity that, yep. and right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm, uh, I'm uh, channeling the, the inner Chuck, right? When, when he says that, call somebody, <laughs> right? <laughs> But uh, that, and I, I think once people get more familiar with the systems, those calls get fewer and fewer, people follow through, and then, and then there, what I would say is more uh, one-off nuisance calls that people take care of, and then we just continue to move forward. So yeah. um, these are good discussions, but yeah. I would, I would just say, I'm, I'm looking over at Julie, because this is one of her things that just is, it's just so frustrating, right? So she sends out, we know this is going to happen every year in January. This is when people create those. They create them incorrectly. They create them as a wildfire. Um, 
She sends out email after email after email. We spent a lot of time talking about it at CDAT last year to be, or not last year, last week, feels like a year ago, <laughs> to, you know, really talking to folks about that. And I don't know if you, yeah. So I, th we, I think, I guess what I would say to that is we feel your pain on that one and that continue to reach out whenever you see them. And, and I guess to everyone when they see them in their systems. Sure, I'll add. Um, just something that people should be aware of if they create them as a wildfire and there's a request already on them, they can't change the incident type of preposition if there's already a request on them because there's different coding behind the scenes in our lab. Yeah, so she was saying that um, if, if a user creates them as a, as a wildfire incorrectly, accidentally, and they've ordered resources on them, they can't change them to a preposition. Can they change them to a support? Because that isn't the same logic. They can, yeah. So they can, they can change. They cannot change them to a preposition because there's logic, right? So that that logic that lives within that system is 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 quite a bit different for that particular event kind category than for any of the other ones. They can change them to a support. However, you know, that's that's another one where people use support completely incorrectly. You know, support is very specific about what it should be used for, mm -hmm. and maybe we need another kind if it's not meeting the need. Support is supposed to be for the incident support organizations when you need to bring in an expanded dispatch, when you your MAC group has to come in, when you've got um, vehicle inspectors that you've had to bring in, when you have to open up a staging area, you know, for to help support the expanding and contraction of the dispatch center. It's not to be used for, oh, I supported that fire. That is not okay. <laughs> that can, is they, not can, can they, can they, switch it from wildfire to pre-suppression or is that blocked too if there's resources that's, attached that's the preposition pre yeah that that okay. has logic on that one but is so there, is there anything in Irwin that keeps the system from doing that Irwin doesn't stop it Irwin won't but they won't read it in oh so you're saying it might be better if Irwin stopped it if, if yeah. it's uh that we help validate so that you don't find it so actually, that's a great idea because then that way yeah. might prevent some of those issues yeah, from getting bigger and bigger. Side, yeah, I, I changed it. it. It went. Who who all create? Who all has the ability outside of IROC to switch a wildfire to a prepo application wise wildfire? Is that something? Familiar with. Yeah. Wildcat cannot right now, but we're hoping to have it in the next month or two. Okay. Or three. <laughs> So my, my suggestion for the logic there would be that I, if somebody takes an instant type and tries to change it to a preposition, that Erwin look in the request table and say, is there any request there? Yes. Stop. No. Okay. If there sense. isn't. Okay. Yes, you can. Are there any IROC requests that wouldn't integrate that would potent could could we potentially be changing something that you know something didn't get supply integrated? Supply requests. Yeah. Supply requests uh, would do it. They don't go under Irwin anyways. Right, but I mean, like, would that then you know because Irwin doesn't see the requests, or would we then know. that still allow that and cause problems? Let's unpack that one. Yeah. Let's unpack <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, Let's put that as a as a as tech a, talk. Unpack that idea. one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I kind of wanted to go back a little bit. Yes, please. Just, just to say, like, you know, what in, what applications are impacted by kind of the things we were talking about, like which applications should be. Uh, allowing uh, relationships to be created outside of conflict detection. That's a great one. So I, I, we, we've, we've talked about this a little bit internally. Um, so which applications should be able to create those relationships outside of conflict detection? So when the trigger's not met, right? Because that's something that we definitely have seen that we need to have it. So definitely the CADs, right? I'm looking over at CAD people. No. <laughs> I'm oh, okay. <laughs> to be able to create a relationship where conflict detection measures are not, uh, triggers are not met, providing response to, for an example, um, which application should be able to do it because this becomes a lift for those applications, right? And so 
obviously the, the CADs. I would, is there, since, BJ, since Inform kind of acts as a quasi CAD for instant record creation. Okay. Could, could, could you create those relationships? You do it in your splice. I mean, they identify potential conflicts, but the problem is that but not everything they. But you don't create the relationship. You do it a little bit differently, right? Yeah, yeah. We're not doing a parent-child or any of that, right? Yeah, but you do. Yeah. So that's something to sort of think about because I do think there could be a need. I think for the most part, how how often do you see? instant records that are created and inform two of them that are the same record it only occurs when there's poor communication with somebody doing a bulk upload and then the next step after they do that i end up telling them guess what all of these that are potential conflicts you need to go through and fix and then you know they, they move forward with trying to <laughs> get all that stuff done um, that said, usually um, the conflicts is with a, a what I've seen for conflicts is um, a 209 has come in or it's been one of those um, border fires where a wildcat record already gets put in there. Um, but um, in a majority of cases, I would say less than 10% of the bulk uploads come in with that and so we essentially have two fodder records for a single incident um but but that's part of the process for the 50 or so uh state smes they're supposed to go through and and fix that if they do a buck upload as we get more and more states on to uh inform and actually using it like minnesota massachusetts maine um integrating fi response you know, we actually drastically re reduce that number. So, um, uh, for the need of people using the bulk upload process, there's always going to be a, a couple states here and there. I think that will um, still need to use it. But um, I, I wanted to hear from fire response too, oh, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I was just going to say, maybe to be more specific, which which applications should be able to create an OR out of conflict detection? And then also what what applications would need to create this post-fire relationship? Because I know not everybody creates like bears and, and FR. So maybe we start with the OR. So you already do. I'm looking I'm for those who are not in the room, I'm looking at Elliot with fire response. So um you already create on on conflict detection an OR. Can can your system do it if the detection triggers are not met? Do you have the ability to uh, create yeah, that sure. relationship? I was thinking you did. Yeah. And and I and so IROC, everything is conflict detection. Can you can you create that relationship if the conflict detection triggers are not met? And I guess the question is should they be should they be able to yeah. And I, and I would say, Julie, that the one that comes to mind is one that I think is going to be a necessity, um, only because I haven't, haven't seen how the CADs are going to handle it, is, is the bears. Most people right now do their post-fire incident record creation in IROC, but mostly because I don't think they could in the CADs before. Um, so when I think about the language that we put in the MOPE guide, and I'm going to tell the language that we put in the Red Book in the MOPE guide, you know, there's two places you're supposed to create incidents, wildland fire incidents. So these are a little bit different because they're not ignition based, right? Um, so we know that we want to either do it in form or do it in a CAD. And then we put words in there that said, BJ, help me with this. You know, if, if you don't have either one of those available to you, work with your local SOPs as to which one you're going to come in. It feels like the majority are coming in via IROC and maybe right after that fire code. Um, you're probably right. Yeah, we don't see it for very. You're right. I, I meant okay. incident record creation. Thank you. Um, so, thinking that need is 
we're going to need to have a way, right, for folks to be able to do that in IROC. Yeah, just think about it. <laughs> and then a 209? I don't think so. I, I think we, we get all of that resolved before it gets to you. Do you guys create, would you ever need to create, you, you don't even want to see the logs, right? No. You never want to create no. that. And you, would, and you would never have a situation where no. you would want to post fire. Okay. <laughs> I love Megan. Don't we read in wildfires and complexes? And, and we can create wildfires and complexes and other stuff, but we can't create no art. So yeah. Okay. Uh, right. What is it? Everything's as clean as they can create all of them in the same application. And yeah. So mix them from different apps and create these relationships. But once everything's built, CADs and yeah. that, then it should be all built in the same system. The, the one that we, yeah, the one that we still have to, and, and now I'm shifting a little bit to complexes and those relationships, if they're in a different dispatch center, we can't do them in the CAD. We have to do them in 209. Yeah. One of the things that, that I keep getting and then dropping is currently we have business logic in there that says you cannot create an OR. It's only on update that we have wildfire and then it has to be updated because you would never intentionally create an OR, right? right? And so when I'm thinking about the incident type and the relationship though, Mary, I think we need to go back to that when they when we don't trigger, right? I, I just think we might need to relook at that piece. Yeah, I guess I guess I'm just trying to. I know. Get a sense I just I went off because I keep I kept losing it. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> trying to get a sense of who's impacted by these changes. Yeah. And if if folks are you know yeah we we have it listed as highest I think probably because there's kind of a piece with inform I'm hearing about like you know do we need to read back some of these relationships? Yeah. yeah. Um, but. Do we have, I guess, uh, I don't want to say commitment, but is there, do people think that we should be pursuing this and, and are folks going to be coding to this um, for version nine? Um, and, if, and if the CAD should be making both of these relationships, that, that they would be I think, moving forward with I think this. we're going to need CADs and IROC. CADs really. and IROC, and then potentially Wolf how. You know, potentially, if, if it comes back for inform, maybe yeah. on some of these, like potentially post fire. Yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah. We'll so we're just know 209, no fire code, no. Yeah. And we'll send out notes as such, right? So that folks can, because I know, I know folks are going to have to, especially, you, we'll have to go back and talk about it a little mix amongst yourselves and, and then come back. I was thinking that we should take a break. Yeah. Um, if that's a good if that's a good place. Yeah, I guess it's just our do we have a thumbs up on, you know, moving forward with the OR outside of conflict detection piece and then um, for Irwin making it valid fire relationships. Um, yes, Irwin creating the relationships, the systems. The um, systems need to do it. Well, yeah, yeah, but yeah, us providing the mechanism yes. for folks to create post fire relationships. You so used to looking at Don and looking at Greg. <laughs> it's a business one, right? Yeah, yeah. I guess from from our perspective, I know we we implemented the prescribed escape, and I know folks are still coding to that. And for us, this is kind of like our, you know, trying to move puzzle pieces around. So if there are, you know, if folks are like, this is great, but we we are not going to have the ability to bring this in you know, in version nine, that, that helps us mentally categorize what we, you know, kitchen focus on. Oh, yeah, exactly, yeah. Exactly. And BJ just made a comment on there saying that he forgot to mention that on bulk upload error checks are completed to eliminate most duplicates, but some do sneak through. So there is always work for the responsible agency doing the upload to verify the data using the uniqueness tool to ensure minimal errors. Do you have a dashboard of the uniqueness tool or do you, can you just filter on these ones are at this level and yeah. Megan. Yep. Um, Thank you. <laughs> with the new prescribed escape. Yeah. Does that turn into an FI? 
they, uh, they're two different records. Yeah. Different records, but we would still get the... Yeah, because so I, I always think that one's interesting, too. I yeah. think you and I might have talked about this one for a little bit, right? So the business rule from the fuels folks is the prescribed fire record comes in, um, and then it escapes. They, we've coded so that you cannot update a prescribed fire to a wildfire to force folks to create that second record. Okay, so it's this brand new... Brand new so record. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I think you're okay. I think you're okay. We did actually last week, I think Michigan, they accidentally created their fire as a as a prescribed fire and it should have been a wildfire. Is that what it was? Yeah, I think that's what it was. So anyway, we're like, mm -hmm. we gotta start over. Yeah, so okay, let's take a break. We're two, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. We'll see, we'll see everyone back here at 25 after. This still? Yeah, it's five. It's five. Yeah. So, eight. Event kind categories, right? So Yeah. 
So the source in the would the goal be the state goes to the So they would like to let go of their Yeah, and you know, all the you know, back end stuff and allowing bulk bulk uploads and there's some of their systems I know previously have been pretty long ago. So no one knows that. Yeah, but it's but it's it's a you know that group for a while now. It's been it's been slow. It's complicated to try to figure it all out, and then cross talk between the five different agencies. And the bringing all the states and all the top leaders talk about the infrastructure. Oh yeah, it's crazy. I get lost. I get lost in this stuff too. Either I just tune out, or I just yeah, I just don't know enough about it. That whole conversation I had to have with you. I'm gonna go to you. Yeah. 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 What systems are coming from? Who can do it? You know, what about other resources? Uh, like, so, you know, how is it supposed to be? That doesn't explain any of that. So, this is so, yeah, it's my yeah, 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 the whole, you know, anywhere along the line, I mean, is it kind of wicked or does it work with I those it's sort of like all that fuel stuff it doesn't usually fall to one person. 
Documentation I love it. Yeah. 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 And the clocks are different on that side and that side. <laughs> That one says it's time. That one says it's not quite time. So, yeah. Okay, we have almost everybody back. So, one thing really quick Mary, Mary was going to just articulate a thought as far as our, our expectations. Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to say, you know, I was kind of trying to get an idea of like who, what, in, what applications were impacted so we could kind of keep those folks in mind by, you know, all of our decisions and like we're not leaving anybody out. Um, but also I, I, you know, we recognize that folks aren't going to have an answer as to whether or not they're read, they'll be ready to implement something like this today. But in, in a, you know, a future extended team call, we want to like um, unpack that or like go through yeah. uh, around Robin and ask, you know, are you going to move forward? Right. Or if it's a hard no, we can't do it. Yeah, and, and here today, Anything? if we're talking about stuff that's like pie in the sky, we don't want to like continue the conversation and, and I don't want to say waste time, but, but waste time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, then, and then Rochelle had a, some really good insights for me, and uh, I have to share. <laughs> Um, so just talking about the post fire records, right? So I think it's important to know to, to note on the because those post fire activities for Forest Service and DOI are managed very differently. But on the DOI side, it, the the goal would be that at those records originate in right now they're originating in the forest, but we're not going to integrate with there. We're going to focus on informed fuel. So at some point in time, those bear programs they're going to they should in in informed fuels go be going in creating their bare record associating that with the wildfire that they're doing rehab activities on and that is the information that would come into i property cats so so there may be an interim process where we have to create those relationships in operational systems but eventually it's going to originate in those planning systems and they're and that's where they report their accomplishments and all that kind of stuff, right? So just uh, just a point of awareness that yeah. there's we're in flux with some of that, and and so that may shift. But the mechanism, I think, in Irwin is probably the same. Yeah. It's just that the, the source. source of that will change as DOIs transitions to inform fuels, which is very similar. So at first, I looked at Irwin. Big white eyes and then but it's very similar to the concept of how we would expect prescribed fires to come in in the future whereas currently folks are building those in the in the cads or or in iraq because they don't have another place to do so so that source system will which will be a whole new world as far as looking at you know i, don't, I think it'll be mostly for the cads as far as a whole new world i think for everybody else they've already been querying um in this in this manner, um, is there any is there anything else? 
we needed to hit on? No, so there we, we did quite everyone settled when Mary was talking. So I just want you to say it again, Mary. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, when I was asking what applications are impacted by this change, it's just for us to recognize the, the lift of the extended teams you know, in a very broad sense, and that um, I know that folks aren't going to be necessarily able to like, yay, nay, like we're committing to do this or code to this today. But if there's are things that we're saying up here that are like, oh man, you know, we cannot do this. We absolutely not. We can kind of either put that as nay or future um, right off the bat. Um, so. I think in a future extended team call, uh, the Irwin team was thinking, you know, today we get down, you know, who are the impacted that. systems, and then we can kind of do round robins on some of these issues and say, hey, you know, have you guys gone back to your teams, thought about this, or are you guys committed to working with us to, to get this going? Um, yep. for sure, right? So, so if there's any hard no's. Say yeah, yeah. hard no. <laughs> we cannot do this. And that's yeah. yeah, and that's okay. I just we just yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think for the incident relationships, I didn't hear anybody say absolutely not. So no. I think for now we've got a yay. Speak up if, if you feel like okay. Okay. Anybody online? Someone's raising their hand. Perfect. Okay, so we're we're still in our we're still in our highest. Um, uh, everything that we're talking about so far is really still tightly coupled and, and, and related with bringing in the um, the final fire reporting data back into the system. So this is what I'm kind of excited to talk about too, is, is the incident quarantine fall off rules. Um, and, and you'll see we have this in bold down at, at down at the bottom, you know, everyone is, is, is looking for a recommendation from our group today for the number of days uh, uh, from the community so that we can so we can move forward and implement. So we have talked about, well, for example, IROC has, has something pretty cool set up within their system that if something is in quarantine, that well, something is in quarantine, right? It only goes to IROC. It doesn't go anywhere else. It goes from the system that, that created it to IROC so that folks can order on it. But what they've set up to, to, to speed up the, the realization that they have multiple incidents is they make that record invalid within 24 hours and nobody can order off of it. Is that correct? Do you, I can't remember if you make it invalid. I just know you can't order off of it. You just can't order off of it. Okay. And so um, we, we've talked a little bit to the, to the inform team, right, about with the conflict detection resolution that it, that it might be helpful for them, you know, if, if we had some quarantine fall off rules and just some some time uh, frames around that. So we're, we're looking to the community for thoughts. And we know this has been previously proposed and we were going to action on it a few versions ago and then we just Hit me. did not get to it. But. I thought we all agreed last year, year before, somewhere. 24 hours. 24 hours. Yeah. That's fast. Like eight, eight days. days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we so I rocked at 24, uh, 24 hours. Well, I rocked yeah. 24 hours. And you guys do 24 hours. So that's already coded into your system. So that's Cal Fire. Um, and yeah. I was going to say when and when we talk about fall off, the, the idea would be that we're going to take it out of quarantine and make it invalid. So 24 Resolve hours. Resolve the conflict. Yes, okay. yeah, resolve the conflict, take it out of quarantine, make it invalid if it's been. Okay. Yeah, so it's 24 We're hours. About apples and oranges. Yeah. It's creating requests. We all agree. 24 oh, yes, hours. creating requests. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So that yeah. one, you're absolutely correct. We have, we have, yeah. Actually, I don't know that all the systems implemented that like you did. I know for sure that they have. I don't know what. Well, I'll kind of agree to it. Okay. Well, but if they're stopping, Creating orders, like would they actually issue it a request number if it came through the integration after 24? Well, so like Wildcat wasn't doing them until just now. You guys aren't doing them yet. In IFM is not doing them yet. So I think you guys leading leading the charge. And I rock, yeah, of course. I don't know what would happen. Our users will get a message back that says 
you're into installing quarantine, resolve the issue. Love it. Stop so, no doubt. So IROC, is it just in the UI that you stop it or coming integration wise it wouldn't go through either? So if you got a if there was a record that was in quarantine in Wildcat and they created a a request on it after twenty four after twenty four hours, would that get stopped? That might be, that an, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. That might be an Elizabeth conversation. Is she on? Is she on, Elizabeth? Yeah. And, and I know that when we talked about it, yeah. like everyone was like, "Oh no, we're we're going to implement this." So they maybe like we don't. Yeah, they're like, yeah, but good to know, <laughs> just in case something slips through. This. Probably. We probably need to follow up with Wildcat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, we had proposed for this eight days. What's that? Oh, I was just wondering if Elizabeth knew. It might take her a minute. To yeah, sorry. I was just trying to get uh, get something hooked up here. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Sorry. Yeah, I, I guess the answer was. I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head, but I think we would still. Uh, yeah, I'd have to look if if we don't have the incident, but you know, um, I think we would st still assign a number. Yeah, we can run a test if on them. We can. I mean, you know, we're we're kind of you know leaning more towards. IROC is not preventing other systems from doing things. Right. I just want to make sure we're counting on the other systems to enforce this same rule. Yeah, that's a it's a good point. And and I and I know we sort of pivoted to resources, right? This one was specific to incident quarantine, but there are actions based on the incident, so that's why. Yeah, and I guess that I mean it goes into that like if Erwin flips it out of quarantine but invalid, you know. That also changes business rules for. Uh, Woofdis does something along the lines of. Um, what did they call it? I'm trying to remember what Andrew used to call them zombie fires, where they would, they he, he put some fall off rules in them, or Woofdis put some fall off rules then. I'm looking to see who's on, if there's somebody that can maybe speak to that. I'm trying to get Rachel Morgan on the call. Okay, now. thank you. And then go ahead, Tim. Other than the likelihood for bad data with this situation, what's the harm in staying there? Uh, the, the really bad data, the cost, folks are having to untangle at the end. That's that's it. Okay. It's not like life and property, right? Um, is informed, do you have any thoughts on timeframes for incident quarantine fall off rules? I know we've talked briefly about it. Ponder. I think that's okay. Like Mary said, we can come back. Yeah, I mean, it, I think a lot of what I remember hearing is that the incidents that weren't in quarantine had that potential conflict relationship. And because kind of going back to the fact that the B record makes the decisions points on, on all of those, taking the taking the uh, incident out of quarantine and resolving the relationship. If no action is taken, that that's just kind of sitting in there. And I think particularly for, for Inform at the time too, that was like they got to resolve all of those before they could create a, a final fire report type of situation. So I think that helps alleviate that um, for for them um, as well. So yeah, and, yeah. Well, previously we were thinking eight days. No, I know Inform was half perfectly happy with the eight days. Is that good, Julie? Sounds great. Yeah, and then provide some benefit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we will. We won't solidify that, but we're going to come in in a subsequent call with a yes or no. Maybe a, we'll do a poll on a yeah. on a, on an extended team call. Um, hey, hey Kara. Yes, sir. Hey, just something to think about and move on from this, if you want. Um, is you talk about fall off rules and restricting. Um, things to happen after a certain time frame, like I see like IROC after 24 hours can't do orders. 
Mm -hmm. uh, dispatchers and folks in the field will do whatever they need to do to get the job done. Yeah. And they will say, fine, I'll resolve the quarantine. It's mine. I'm going to keep moving on. No, you're right. You're absolutely They're not going to circle back around to fix it. So your data becomes um, not very good. So it's a fine line when you start putting these restrictions on and handcuffing the field um, to get the job done. Think, think, so it's it. a big <laughs> thing that everyone's got to think about when you start putting these hard, fast rules in. Well, and I think then to resolve them, if they've been invalidated, right, we, we can revalidate, right, and, and create a relationship, all those kinds of things. That's something that we could yeah. you know, walk down that road too. Yeah, and I, I think just our, it's been a while since I've taken a look, but the things that are have been in quarantine or, you know, Years. since the beginning of, or just since the beginning of 2023 mm -hmm. that are, you know, still in that state, it's very small. Like, yeah, I think, I think we're so much better than we were Yeah, so people 10 years are ago. resolving them, but yeah. there are still some out there where, you know, if somebody puts an incident in, um, and then they never do anything with it ever again, and it just stays in, in quarantine, and, and, you know, it, yeah. Which is, I think, why we've sort of talked about more than 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it would be like that eight days, like nobody's touched two it. Two weeks. Or, yeah. yeah, or two weeks, so, or you know, whatever that is. I will say this, Tim. One of the things that, that I felt like we learned from our from our data analytics that we did with, with our task group, right, is here, here's the basic time frame that we get almost 90% of our stuff resolved. That's what I was going to say. Look at us. <laughs> and, and that's why I love that we have the data to prove it. And so we, we're not just all speculating because we know there is a one off. We know there's a hundred off out of the 236,000, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, and that becomes a really good way for us to assess our maturity, right? Yeah. So if we have data that indicates that we're getting, you know, 85% of our records corrected, within five days and in two years we're able to do that within three days right it, it helps establish using data now to make decisions gives us opportunities in the future to measure our maturity yeah and so i i think that rather than just kind of picking arbitrary numbers or arbitrary days that we should really use you know, those numbers be data centric and use yeah. data to establish that and and so i think if we we know that that those types of changes are being made within five days, then let's let's do let's apply that to quarantine and let's see what happens, right? If it like blows up, then we can adjust. But I think starting with something that's data based is desirable. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's good business. We um, do that eight days after the quarantine day, or after the last update on that incident, or. Where's your countdown starting? Um, I was thinking of the last time it was updated, updated, but that's another question that I had kind of in the back of my mind too. It's like, is that the case? Or are there like other dates that we need to be looking at? Like fire discovery day? I, I don't know. But fire discovery day, I think it's wow. day. I kind of think quarantine day yeah. too, because we're already so actioning so them within 24 hours. Which I mean, would, yeah, which would be the creative on date time. Which would be the creative yeah. on date time? Well, it, it party, uses the relationship yeah. on date time. Right, which would be the, which should be the same as one. created on. Because you immediately created. go into quarantine when you're yeah. created. I mean, because you don't go into quarantine on update. Right, right. you only go into yeah. quarantine on create. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, yeah. How often do people update quarantined items? until they can't anymore yeah. <laughs> really is, is honestly if, if you have an expanded dispatch for an example if you have an extended expanded dispatch who that's the only lens they have is working in iraq and ordering off of it not knowing that it's in quarantine um it, and i want to be clear they they do there's a user is notified <laughs> that it's in quarantine but they might be missing it because is the notification in portal if you're in quarantine or is it only in DMT? Um, I don't, I think it's only in DMT. So I think it's DMT. I think it's DMT too, Gina. DMT. So they would be work. Yeah. so where, where the dispatcher's work is in Portal. 
So they might not know that they're in quarantine, right? And so those folks could be doing a lot of work. And I'm telling you in 24 hours, an expanded dispatcher, Gina, can put like 3,000 orders on an incident. Oh, yeah. So um, it could be but big. Gina's special. Gina is special. <laughs> okay. So they have to redo what they just did on the original. And they do have to redo. So it's painful when you goof up. We don't we don't have a way to just move it over. Which is probably how we've got it's, the 85 percent result. It's kind of intentional, right, Julie? Which it's kind of intentional that we can't fix, do an easy fix for them so that they stop doing it. Yeah. And it's honestly probably higher than 85 percent in terms of what's ended up being resolved in the grand scheme of things. Okay. But um, but yeah, so I'm hearing. You know, using the created on date time as the start, starting the clock. Yes. Um, and, and looking at five days. Oh, well, um, yeah, we, we're sitting 120 hours, five days um, as, as a proposal. Megan says yes. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't bother me. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing you. I'm just teasing you. Yeah. yeah. I, and then we'll let's let's live on that for a minute, marinate, and yeah. then we can come back to that one. And, and no, so nobody's so, hearing any like red flags. Right. I mean, other than what Tim said, and I think I don't want I'm not discounting Tim Tim Bozar's comments. Um, because I don't want to force people to speed, right? I don't want to force people to do something that we don't want them to do. Um, we want them to resolve it. We want to be able to make it easy for them to resolve so they do resolve it, right? Instead of having to look for alternate solutions. So how would somebody make it active again so that they can resolve it? Currently? Yeah, if we were to put this rule in, how do we trigger that? So each system has a different way. Like I'm, I'm looking at folks when you can invalidate it or revalidate. I know in IROC, there's just some, certain folks have that kind of magic wand. I know in um, in, a, in a CAD, they might choose a void or they might choose a different incident type. So they would just change it back. Um, how do you how do you guys do it? They can just change it back. They can just change it back. Um, the and do you, can the user change it back or does it has to be like a developer level person to change it back? You think you can? So in their in their user interface, they can. So at least certain users. How about how about in Alturas? Different. I, I guess we could change the incident type, which would push the whole incident back through again. But I don't think we would change that data right now. Mm -hmm. Come oh, back to his active. Yeah. Although it sounds like you guys have a higher threshold yeah. for quarantine incidents, like getting that action on. No. The incident, you know, before them. Um, but that's something to consider too. Is like if you, if we set these to invalid, do you have a mechanism to bring them back? But I think it's also like how many of those realistically would would, would just uh, dispatchers try to do that? Right now, would that be? I we'd have to go through the end. <coughs> you would. Yeah. Okay. But but I also see where. Now some of these additional relationships can come to play. I know. Then they can resolve the coordinate. Yeah, both are valid. <coughs> Just keep going. Right. And then they're like, ah, but uh, it really it's was. It's actually an OR. Yeah. When the OR is valid, so you're good. To your point, right? Yes, but you would still have to resolve the conflict. Thing we, with the relationship. Yeah. You, right. You have to set the relationship. And folks are used to doing that already. Like they've been doing that for years. They have not, they're not as accustomed to doing it when the detection criteria is not triggered, though. And like, I look at Gina because we've had to deal with a ton of these. Um, okay. So we are, we're, at the, we're at the last one of our, of our highest. And, and, and just so you know, so you can start pondering that these are the ones that are directly correlated with bringing in final fire reporting data. Um, so if you're like, hey, Carrie, you totally missed this whole piece or Inform team or in, in, in Irwin team, you missed the, this entire piece. Um, we'd, we'd like to get those added, or as we move down um, to the next to the next um, the next set, you can say that really needs to be bumped up or whatever. So one of the things that that task group came up with were these were these notification flags, and then the really relevant data elements that we we narrowed down to. It's just these few 
was the unique fire identifier, the incident name, the jurisdictional unit, and the protecting unit. Um, we have, I think, what was originally on the, the business plan, if you've not seen it before, I think I have it here, um, and we could certainly just share it, but what was on the original uh, proposed business plan um, we, we had something in there called like the final unique fire identifier that's been removed. That's not in that that's not in there at all. But this was the wildland fire incident record standard super draft, right? It, we, this was our proposal from from earlier this year. But when we went through as a group where we figured out some of the issues were um, was within um, those key data elements, we drew out we drew out um, uh, some specificity between just general data exchange. This is how we do it. Um, this is this is the expectation. This is sort of a big one that I don't think we actually talked about, Mary. But but some of the things that we were looking and he walked out on me. But um, there's a technical bulletin that's being drafted to address a couple of these. I think Wiffit wanted to look it over. I think Steve Manti needed to look it over a little bit closer before he could say yes. Let's go forward with this. But then an expectation. It's not Irwin driven, that it is data exchange driven, that um, you know, if, if you have a, a data element within your application and it could be updated somewhere else, if you have a data element that is not updated anywhere else, we don't care. But if you have a data element that another system could update at any, any point in time, you would, and, and based on the ADS that we've all agreed to and the permission hierarchies, if there was a change with that, you would bring that back in. You would not not read it. You would not not update it. So that's that's one of the, the keys. If you have a system that um, that ha that is part of integration and you open your record, you would not you, the the data elements that would be updated are only the ones that have been user changed. You would not like automatically repush your entire system. Um, and, and actually, it's kind of funny. We had we had something going on last week or the week before that let us test this to see if it was actually working. Because I was like, well, no problem. That system pushes everything. Um, and then we we opened up their record, and it does not anymore. <laughs> so it was like our one way that we thought we could we could this would actually serve in our benefit. But they absolutely do not do that anymore. They're only so that's the expectation for all of us is that we would only update the record data element if the user updated it. If there, are if there are changes, thank you. It's a tough one to say for me. I don't know why, but it is. Like, if if your system said the acres were ten, and another system said, you know, it's been updated to one hundred and twenty, you would not repush ten back out. Only if your user changed it to three hundred, or if there was a user change, and you had the ADS, would it go back out? Okay. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the logging was in here. Um, and then and then this is the part that we've been talking about quite a bit, right? This this five days, 120 hours, um, some, of, some of that is association behind it. So what we talked about is for uh, the unique fire identifier data element, which we've talked a little bit on Monday, so I'll make this really brief, but it's the concatenation of the year, the protecting unit, and the local number. Um, what we've always done is if there is a change to that, any of those values, um, it would automatically update that unique fire identifier. There became issues down the road with bills that had already been out or FOIA requests when those, when that um, did not match and it became an issue. So we would of course allow the protecting unit to change that actual data element, but it would not update after 120 hours or five days, it would not update that, that unique fire identifier. So that is complicated, Mary <laughs> keeps telling me. She's just like, that's, that's gonna take some work to, to think through and, and how we would actually implement that. Um, and, and the impacts on the other systems in theory would be very minimal, right? Well, I mean, I guess that's one of the questions, right? I mean, we've always just redirected the unique. We've always just redirected it. Mm -hmm. um, fire identifier, and I know people utilize that to make, you know, decisions, decisions or, or filter or use. There, there's, I, I feel like there's just downstream impacts and. 
education. You know, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but also, I mean, is that the is that the way we want to go? Keep freezing that, make a new data element, uh, you know, because because of that. I, I I don't know. I mean, I guess that's just part of it. Is like. And we just we talked about this on what, Monday, Tuesday, yeah. something like that. I think there's just a lot to um, maybe back. maybe we can keep working with pros and cons, right? Um, this is this is something that that got put forward to to Cole and Rochelle, right? That this is here's a recommendation, and now that the recommendation is out there, let's really look at those pros and cons. But no, there's a bit of a timetable on this as far as as, as a plan forward. What what we're not seeing, what we're missing, what could be impactful behind this. Um, there's also been um, some language. That's all the before, the after. What 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 the expectations? There there is some stuff in here as far as like the local incident identifier data element. So that six to ten character data element for the local incident identifier. Just some expectations that they would not be changed unless they were entered in error. Um, and that uh, there would be a compelling reason behind it. Having an agency's local identifier in chronological order is, is not a justifiable reason for that, um, for, for that change. And I'll go back to it, but this is where we talked about these flags, because the other thing was, yes. Oh, sorry, BJ. Um, I, I, I think this five day thing to allow that um, particular value to be changed w would be huge. To, uh, especially in areas where you have in the east a real intermix even within the forests um, currently right now the workaround that they're operating in the dispatch center upstairs is that when an incident comes in they do not integrate it in in cad until um, they get confirmation of uh, where the fire is in the and the ownership so an ic on things so they're before they're integrating it and before it becomes available to the other systems, you know, sometimes it's it's up to 45 minutes to an hour, depending upon where the fire's at. Um, so that's that's kind of um, that would be huge to give five days to get the get the thing right, knowing that our priority is to get Pulaski's right uh, on the ground, right? Exactly. Um, so. Yeah, and, and we've been doing a lot of, I sort of switched screens on you, I think it changed, but uh, just folks just don't know, right? They just, they just, they just don't, and I don't want them to have to be troubled by some, you know, some integration things downstream. They want to be able to do their job as to say, get, get Plaskies on the ground, et cetera. So we've, we've thrown out some stuff for them. Here's your tactical pause, right? Here's something that you can do. You can still work all you want. You can work in your CAD, you can order, you can mobilize people left and right. You don't need to fight, you know, all of this stuff that you can continue to do until you actually get somebody there that says, yeah, this is the fight. This, this year's our point of origin. This, this is what we know to be the case that, that you don't have to have it in Irwin. And I think the sticking point was always aircraft, right? We've worked really closely with the geographic areas and the NIC as far as mobilizing aircraft on knee boards rather than within a system. I do know that there's, uh, looking at Julie and, and Elise, because when we were in California, that there's some California SOP on the federal side where they actually assign their, their A number in the knee board before they get it from IROC, which really is not the best plan <laughs> because then it changes on them right and so things like that business rules and that that folks are I think business practices that folks are implementing right now that are actually being stymied by some of this so so we've made it really clear this is heads up you just don't have to do this and and um, in talking with other CADs, et cetera, to have something similar, this is obviously specific specific to Wildcat. And then we walk them through, this is this is what a potential conflict in quarantine is and what it means and, and, and what it'll look like in your system. We're getting new screen captures right now from Wildcat E to, to, to update these, et cetera. But this, is, this was put out because you know, walking folks through what's going to happen. And then, of course, we get to the actual duplicates, which are different, right? And then how to manage and handle those. And I always smile at Gabriella because she gave me these templates that I work from to this day. Um, so agreed, BJ, 100%. Um, and I think I think it could be helpful. 
Uh, the only other thing that I was going to say, and I'll look to, I'll look to um, Megan on this one, because when we start talking about incident name and some of the things that she's had to do with, at the NIC, right, as far as if there's an inappropriate name, et cetera, that, that she cannot put in the IMSR, that you use the unique fire identifier yeah. in the interim um, so, so that she can put in there. Um, we have hit that really hard this year with our with our spring tour, as I like to call it, as we talk to all the different dispatch centers about expectations and naming conventions, and that Irwin is now um, has has implemented uh, the standard as far as the data elements goes. But there's no way we can pick up on an inappropriate name. It was actually kind of funny. Somebody had an inappropriate derogatory name for one of their incidents the other day, and they called me because they said, hey, it's not going into Irwin. It must be because, you know, it could be interpreted as a bad name. I'm like, that's exactly it. It's because they had a space before and after. But I was like, stop using those. Like, don't, don't use that. <laughs> stop using that name. <laughs> for the love of Pete, if you have to wonder, it's wrong. <laughs> I did have one thing, and I don't want to go down a rabbit trail, but just kind of thinking about if we prevented changes to the unique fire identifier after five days or whatever that may be, and then if there's a subsequent change, um, I just think about how we have validation in Irwin on duplicates of the unique fire identifier, and if the jurisdictional unit has changed since, um, you know, just that uniqueness of people going to bump up against something because I think so. So jurisdiction, of course, we don't care. But protection, we for protection, yeah. Right? Um, so, and we want the jurisdiction to update for sure. But and like if that updates, you know, I, after the fact, and usually we would reconcatenate that unique fire identifier if we hold it. It's already used, so I think it's off. Okay. I think they'll still get the error. They'll get the error that it's already been used. Well, yeah, yeah. I guess that's what I mean. Like, and then it, is that? And that's okay. Is that, okay. okay. We don't. We don't. <laughs> just check and if they're like, if somebody's like, hey, this is actually in this protecting unit, um, and this is local incident identifier is not. You know, I should be able to still use that because that's not in my. I will say this. One. So, um, Wildcat E currently. The um, the logic that they've programmed into the system is every incident will start with not this year but next year. Every incident will will start with one zero 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 one, and um, so if it's the same dispatch center, of course there's not, and we we know when if it becomes the other dispatch center, there's that. Um, but I think that when it validates against it originally, we've already covered that base. Yeah, I guess I just mean if there's subsequent ones, like if it's been transferred to a different dispatch center, we didn't reconcatenate the unique fire identifier. That local incident identifier is now kind of burned between the two. It kind of speaks to the issues that we have with that local ID number, right? That there's the the solution that's in place right now for that application is if you share a protecting unit, jurisdictional unit, let's just say, because you use your jurisdictional unit for protection. But if you share one of those with other centers, and we did some research, I think the, the one that shares the most is, is 11. There's a handful of them that share them 11 times, and then they share with their neighbors as well. So it starts to become, and they tell two friends, and they tell two friends. So if there is that shared unit ID, the, the user is adding a letter at the end of 00001A, 00001B. It's always a little bit easier to solve on this side than that side, but that's current, and we, we think there might be some changes there. Um, Alaska had some issues with that as well, just because they issue fire numbers, right? And so I don't think, I'm kind of running through scenarios in my mind, sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm, not, and I don't want to take us down like a really yeah. specific solutioning path, but I guess I'm just trying to... Um, Is Blair beyond? He's always the one that picks up things on here that we miss, yeah. I'll let him I'm, on, I'm on, but I kind of lost the thread here. <laughs> <laughs> really? I was so concise. <laughs> we, we were talking about that if we if we lock the unique um, fire identifier after five days, instead of updating it when a protection unit updates based on whatever changes after that amount of time, we know we're talking about a really small percentage of things. That's the other thing. We're talking about a super small number. Um, is there a chance that in a subsequent incident we could butt up against 
a duplicate um, unifier identifier. Yeah. Don't think so, Steve, but. No, I, I think so. I mean, first of all, let's just be clear. Unique fire identifiers are not unique. They never have been assuredly unique. So, I mean, we've got that. But, um, I, you know, I heard you I heard you say that, you know, the CADs tend to or automatically issue fire numbers. So I think there is every possibility that you could uh, subsequently compose a unique incident identifier that has a duplicated fire number, you know, if you're changing the well, protecting about unit the of that. whole thing, right? So I think, I kind of think we got to pull data. I kind of think we have to pull data, but think that through for me, would you? Um, yeah, I don't even know how, I'm trying to think about how we even pull data. And like you said, maybe this is like five incidents in a row. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm just saying. I, I, you can't use it twice. You know, I think it's worth taking the action and then see. seeing okay. if we have any issues. I think so too. I, I, I do know a couple of years ago we had some duplicate unique fire identifiers. That has been resolved, the issue that was behind that. So I really don't think the system will allow it anymore. No, it won't allow it, but I guess I'm saying like people are going to try to submit like a CAD and say like, why is this not going in? It says there's a duplicate unique fire identifier. And so if, if that's just really small, I mean, like I said, I don't want to we tell take us down a path, but I guess I'm just yeah. trying to consider. We could try to make it happen, but I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of with you, Rochelle. Let's go down the path and I think we can notify the health desks. We could, you know, because we don't care about the number. We just need to know what the number is. So uh, the identifier piece, yeah. So with this one, is it just is the proposal then to have someone after 120 hours not update the unique fire identifier, and that's the that's the action, and we just need an like an assessment of who's impacted by that. Yeah, and it, we re we reset it out. I don't know if Morgan had a chance to join too, because I know Morgan was giving me some good input on on this when we were when we were talking about it. She was part of the task group, um, and and it's really a finance piece. The finance folks were really interested in this um, big picture. So, any you guys are still good with it, right, Julie? Okay. She was another one. She'll and find she'll find it if it's created yeah. on date time as well. That's when we start the clock. Or yes. I love those questions. Yeah, from created on. Yeah. I think so. I love it. She's like, data, let's get it right. <laughs> and I know we mentioned a couple other data elements here. But we did. We're focusing on the entire identifier and okay. preventing changes to all of these. Yeah. And, and, and I. Uh, Brandon just told me, Steve, your, your hand's up too, but really quick before we come back to you, I just wanted to, especially with what you just said, BJ, the number and, and then the name are, are all under under this as well. Jurisdictional unit, we said it, it needs to integrate as as all general update at, at will, update anytime we have, that's, that's exact. We really want that information. We don't want to impede anybody from doing that ever, but they are interested in, in a flag where, the, where there's been a change um, just information only. Can you go back up to the Yeah, did I have a typo? I probably did. I'm going to go ahead, Steve, while, while Tim's reading. Yeah, so um, I apologize that this is uh, retreading some country that you already covered, but, you know, so we're talking about these flags, which is good. I'm looking at a document that's entitled draft business rules for data exchange. Where are we in terms of process? Because, you know, I, I know, you know, we've heard from some of the communities, you said incident business, but, you know, virtually every incident is going to have a fire code generated. So, you know, for example, what you're showing on the screen forces virtually every incident into that second group, which requires special coordination and consultation. So I, are we still eliciting feedback on this uh, or where, yeah. where are we process wise? Yeah, that's a great, great question. We, 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 we did put it in the tour, right? So every NWCG meeting that we could get onto this spring or fall, winter, spring so far, we've, we've shared the concept. Um, it, it's really back to Rochelle and Cole 
Yeah, and I was just thinking we need to put this on the agenda for the DMC for, for May 8th. It, yeah. It, and I think that that means we have like two items, NARA and this. Yeah, and we, they've seen it once and they've definitely had to do now, so the marination piece, right? This is one of those, we're gonna go for it or not, you're gonna rip the Band-Aid off or not, right? And so here, here's here was the proposal, totally open to massaging the proposal. And we, you know, sometimes it's just better if you put something on paper instead of just talking about the concept. And so this was the, the paper. We have not had any <gasps> responses. We have not had any, no, this isn't gonna work for us. We have had all support um, so far, Steve. Okay, that's that's good to hear. And I apologize for my disengagement. The, the one thing that, you know, I, I think is an overarching concept, but I don't know that it's just super clear is, you know, there is a sense that there's a right answer for any of these data fields. And we don't want to suppress right answers we definitely to accommodate systems. So, you know, we're building business rules to say, hey, you know, that's going to be awkward if that gets changed or that can get changed, but it's not going to do what you think it's going to do in terms of recomposing the unique incident identifier. But, you know, throughout any of this effort, I feel like the overarching principle should be never to suppress the right answer, okay. but rather how to make accommodations so that when people put in the right answer, you know, it doesn't upset the apple cart somewhere along the way. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I think we've written it that way. Um, and, and at least that was the intent. We get an updated jurisdictional unit, we use it. That's the right one. We get an updated protecting unit, we use it. That's the right one. We find out two months later, it wasn't the right one. We update it, we now know. We have a log of when that change was made. So those decisions that were made prior to that change have been justified and done appropriately, right? Um, go ahead. I, I think the other thing that this does is it is it is a little bit of a a cultural shift for some users or applications, right? In that you have to stop looking for the intelligence in a code right. and use the actual data field. Exactly. You know, jurisdictional agency, protecting yes. agency, don't derive that from a code. Use the data field itself. Right. And 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 that's that may be a, a little bit of a shift for some. Yeah. Well, and, and so this is part of that notification flag, right? That, yeah, it's a shift. This turned out to be a state fire. It actually looks like it's a, I mean, our data shows with the time that's not gonna happen almost never, right? Yeah. Um, and so, but I really wanted to know that intelligence that I'm no longer getting, I can still get it because it's in the right field and each system can choose how to handle this the way the way they want. like. What's in the um, the unique fire identifier is not what's in the protecting unit, so I'm going to make it red. That's a notifier that, hey, this is different. And then I can find some intelligence somewhere else within the systems that they're different. So when we get called upon to to explain our data, we, we, we have a path here. It's super clear as to how we ended up where we ended up. And I know we already have in the early incident history a way to track when those things yep. have changed. Um, so, yeah, so is, I guess we'll not, the intent is not to suppress the, the right answer, I think is what was said. Yeah. So we aren't going to, we aren't going to make any restrictions on incident name jurisdiction, any of that at all. We could, if we need to, well, we're going to suppress the change of the unique fire identifier, but those data yeah. elements we won't. Yeah, right. So, I mean, if, if people need to like to look and be able to see that it changed, I mean, that information it does exist, and we could make it into a dashboard. Yeah, or something like that if people need it. That's exactly what I was just going to say, yeah. Mary. Thank you. Um, we we know that this could be a lift for the systems, right? As far as that flag or being able to read that flag back. For, for a CAD to be able to say that that might be something that's not in their current development cycle as far as something that can be attained. So in the interim, we talked about a, a dashboard within, I'm throwing out observer, I don't know where it could be, right? We we talked about, um, well, actually you talked about it because you're way more knowledgeable about this kind of stuff. So where we could put these kinds of dashboards so that folks could have access to them to a link that would be able to 
local dispatch center to kind of click in and see here's my incidents that their protecting unit does not equal the protecting unit that is in their unique fire identifier should have that intel that they could start messaging as they, as they move forward dashboard whatever well and i mean i think it i don't know so, some of it kind of goes back to that data exchange standard you're talking about yeah. like if there's a change that happened to be able to consume that and see what the difference is to what you have in your system kind of related to it yeah Does, So ponder, Steve, because I'd be really interested in your insights as we as we sort of move forward. But I think we're meeting everyone's needs with this one, and I might just be really Pollyanna <laughs> in, in wanting to, to put our best foot forward, but I really do think that we might be onto something. It might not be perfect yet, but we're there, and Michelle, you're thinking. Okay, should I move on, or do you have a thought? No, go ahead. Okay, um, okay so let's just take a quick moment did we miss anything that that oh we are not going to be able to bring that data in yet without going oh, no, okay know. that we that that wasn't sort of captured on that the highest is there anything that i was like there's not a chance we can do that okay and i i was just looking at julie's why i called on her but in any any other system all right uh you You're talking about this in april rather than October. Yeah, thank you for saying that. It was a bit of a lift, right? And we're we were super happy to get it out. And, and the plan is to really mold this into our actual plan by May June. May June. <laughs> and, I don't know. Maybe just to expectate uh, expectations on something like this. There's a lot of stuff on this list, you know, like the there's stuff that we'll probably find that we won't be able to hit and we'll hopefully have better idea between now and June. Yeah. So um, you know, there's a lot here and maybe this helps us form a version 10 list too. Well, architects and the people doing the work behind the scenes have a chance to that actually oh, understand, understand, yeah. understand what it is instead of our little magic wand. Yeah. 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 And I think that, you know, just process wise, what this does is it means that where in October we had to go through everybody votes, checks, yes, like we're going to have to do that on an extended team call, oh, yeah. Yeah. which means that everybody's actually going to have to get on the call and participate, yes. and then they're held, then we're accountable for what we do on that extended team call, right? Because we're not doing it in a face-to-face -face meeting. Yeah. So we're just kind of shifting some of these processes, and we just all have to shift recognize that in moving this from an October discussion an April discussion that then we have other ways that we have to kind of accommodate that. Maybe just an idea rather than a call that people might not be able to get on. But like I feel like we did a spreadsheet one time where you could say yes or no. That's or, the plan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we're definitely going to use. We, I, I think people really liked it. I think it was helpful and it really um, lumped things in a way that it was that was easy to put their response and their thoughts behind. So that that is the plan. We'll move it over to that. I, couldn't get it into that before this call, I'll be honest, or, the, or this yeah, meeting. Yeah. We just don't have some of those answers of like what, what, what your lift would be. Level of yeah. is, um, still collecting a couple of user stories from here. And, and, and that's what I'm thinking before, you know, June, yeah. by June. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Put a time frame target yeah. data reporting back to see whether or not. Yeah. Live yeah. Later than August. Yeah, and maybe you know we'll 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 send out the sheet right, just so folks know what what all those elements were that they could look at and re refresh their memory on that. It'd be blank, but you could have it, you know, for sure. And, and some of the bigger discussions, like the informed reintegration and things like that, where we want to get a solution solutions together beforehand. So. Yeah. So our, our our plan from here behind behind the the curtain is we the 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 Irwin team are going to meet. I can't remember I said that at the onset, so I apologize if this is redundant. But we're going to are uh, yeah, repetitive with it. We are going to to, to have a, a week long whatever session where we'll draw this all out and, and come up with those ideas or thoughts and option A, option B, option C for folks to look at and, and further evaluate. Right, Brandon? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Down in Utah. Down in Utah. <laughs> so much easier to plan to something. Um, OK, so moving forward. Yeah, yeah for sure. So this one is Marley on the phone and 
Maybe we could ground up Keith. Could you force Keith in here? <laughs> we keep trying to have this conversation. We keep losing Keith during this part of the conversation. But um, so the incident type endorsements overhead based on, on business rules, and this has to do with all hazard and um, in wildfire. And basically, Mary, what, what the Irwin team is kind of waiting for is which ones are which, right? Yeah, I can I can go into that a little bit. Yes, I think please. We, we've had a lot of discussion about this, and you know, technically from the Irwin side, it seemed pretty straightforward. But as we unpacked it, there are, uh, you know, I think especially we heard from the CAD saying, okay, if there's going to be multiple, uh, you know, for example, a person has two firefighter type two calls. The difference is one is an endorsement of RX, the other one is an endorsement of as well. And which one am I supposed to serve up to my users when they're trying to roster? <laughs> um, and you know, I think from from that perspective, I think there was we just needed, and, and not just Irwin. I think just everybody, everybody needed that it. crosswalk mm -hmm. to determine. Okay, if it's a prescribed fire, these these endorsements can go to that fire. So. so so what I have up right now is just uh, so Marley and, and Julie and I got together and, and we just we just took a first stab at this, right? Julie is th these are these are the ones that that come to mind for us. Um, we did not include training. Is there anything else that you recall that we were sort of unsure about? Um, but but I, I'd say this is the first the first step. So this is Gabriella this music. Is this so. Is it um, totally blanking on David Lee's wife's name? Sarah. Sarah Lee, thank you. This is Sarah. Oh. This is Sarah. Sarah, Sarah Lee, is she the NWCG lead on that? And then, so. and then Steve, right? Is he the chair, Griffin? So. And so the last correspondence we had with them was when we sent them this and, and kind of want, where's the decision lie? Keith Smith is 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 the decision. Does this list look like what you had in mind um, as well to, to for the crosswalk behind the scenes for this all hazard wildfire endorsement? And for those of you who are not really aware, go ahead. See you thinking. Keep going. So for those of you who are not really aware of what we're trying to solve for, right? Is there's been a bit of a cultural shift, Gabriella? Tell me if I'm saying this wrong, but there's been a bit of a cultural shift where the baseline qualifications are all hazard and then you would get sort of a, a wildfire endorsement so the thought process is okay <laughs> this is something that i'm not super close to so please feel free to jump in so if um the the, the thought process is you would start with this this all hazard but we didn't know what data with incident types were associated with all with all hazard because it's never really been discussed before it's just been like that's all hazard so we're trying to associate the event kind category appropriately for the subsequent request that the qualifications would be associated with. So it's a qualifications data resource integration question. So I'm not going to address what you're doing up here. Okay, you can address the bigger picture. Yes, I'm going to go a little higher because what Thank are you, you doing there? Do whatever you probably say. Okay. <laughs> so as far as all hazard or all risk, um, when you look at the audience that I, the members of the associations that I, agencies that I represent, we are. Our mission statement is always all hazard. Our work is always all hazard. Gotcha. Don's not here in the room, but you guys are all hazard. Your yes. mission statement is not just wildfire. So we have to be uh, understand this. So one of the first applications that were developed in that arena was IQS on a national basis. And that was um, uh, we had input. We had a person on our committee during the initial part of that in the mid mid 90s from Cal Fire. And Cal Fire's mission is all hazard and everything they do. OK, that helps me a lot, actually. And so um, IQS was designed that way where you can so for example let, let me go forward a few years and don's not in the room so his father go get him 
That's okay. I was just kind of giving. He's like, yeah, he's not involved. It's okay. His father was heavily involved in this all hazard um, through the FEMA Act Committee. So wildfire is one of the committees that stand on this much larger group. Okay. And I don't even know when that was. So in the mid like 2008, all the way in 2008 or something like that. Met with a group in Houston of all of these different disciplines of hazards, and Wildfire was one of those. And Don's father was part of that committee. And that's when that discussion about FEMA working on taking control of all of that and working, you know, that, all those discussions. And then um, through the since that time, Another thing we've been able to associate the change in direction has been administrations at the presidential level mm -hmm. and their emphasis on this process. So some of them have had an emphasis in this area and some have not. And it's not politically boundary driven, it's just their personal feelings. So we we're really strong to begin with. And uh, FEMA was. So the idea, this has been the discussion, and Marley's been involved in that and others. So the discussion was um, all hazard is you would have a qualification. So I'll use an example, a um, task force leader. So there would be an all hazard task force leader, and there would be a task force assigned to that, and that would be a sort of a standardized level of requirements to get to that qualification. If you were working in another discipline, for example, wildfire, then you would have additional requirements or an additional task book to be to have a WF task force leader qualification. And the discipline or the endorsement catalog would be for wildfire would be the 310-1. There would be another catalog that would be the base AH all hazard list that would have those. So that was the head and the discussion okay. um, for a long time. Then it kind of fades away and then it comes back. I think there's additional or newer conversation going on about continuing that path. Yes. So, um, and I trust we track all those quotes. Because we have urban search and rescue, we have yeah. law enforcement, we have hazardous materials. All of those hazard types have different responses. Have, they don't necessarily have task books, but they have different requirements that they have identified for them so that they can meet those. So when we mobilize them, for example, I rock only understand it's welfare. Right, right now. Correct. And the, the, I think you can say it all age, but so an AH task force leader and a WF task force leader are two different qualifications, not the same. So should it have? And they have different that? requirements. And so yeah. when they do experience, yeah. it comes back to either if they're mobilized as an AH, then it only would come back to the AH experience record. So did we miss the mark a little bit by not calling it all risk? So it, all risk, all hazard, tomato, tomato. Okay. But the problem is, is that the all hazard people said it's not all risk, it's all hazard. Is the professional risk, the political way of saying it? So when you say all risk, they're the all hazard, the all risk people say no, it's all hazard. That's the correct terminology. And that's what you have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so no, it's good. So that's that's where that's at. And so we we've seen that. So the problem is that. Recently, with Irwin and others, is that Irwin, we can enter a qualification as an AH task force leader, and that'll go in as an AH task force leader. Um, there was supposed to be a fix that happened, we talked to Chuck a year ago, where we could change those, um, and I don't think that happened. We could for a little bit, and then it went away. I think you can change. We can have okay. the implementation team. Can't have, have can't have two qualifications. You can't have two, and that kind of leads to this because yeah. it got to that. So, um, and we had a lot of, um, especially in California local government, where they put all of their positions in as AH, and then they would go out, and then they would come back and say, are they law enforcement, or are they, you know, whatever they come back to us, because they use several different hazard types in there. 
and their qualifications as they do that. And so the, as the experience record to come back, they were not marrying up correctly. So, and we couldn't change it before, so then Chuck worked on that. And if we can do it, that's great. We've tested it. It worked to begin with, and then it did stop working, so. Yeah, I think our implementation team folks can work with you guys and see. Okay. If, and if there's something we can identify that we need to patch, we have to do that. And then it was proposed with version eight. What's eight just came out? So we're just an eight, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm so confused, all these numbers. Um, version eight was going to be have the ability to have multiple qualifications with the, the same qualification with different messages. And that got tabled the gel version nine. And so we're anxiously awaiting for that. So that's this. That's the this this the on our list needing to see it. But you and he and I spoke last week about it too that we needed to bump it up as far as priorities go. Yeah, this is a big priority. <laughs> it's a big priority for an for an AS7. Mostly because um, so you have um, resource mobilization software. We have Wildcat E, we have IROC, and then I have 20,000 911 systems that we deal with. And all of them do all hazard, but we don't. And so as they mobilize somebody for a law enforcement event that requires an incident management team, it's an LE hazard type. It's not a WF or an ACH. So, have we identified the gaps? I think so. I think there's two, there's kind of two things that need to happen, I think, to to get this to. I'm coming. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, it might be coming. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the giggle is there was a microphone, she was trying to get off the stand, and it's a wireless. Yeah. <laughs> So there, there are two things that I think need to happen for this, at least at this point, to get this implemented. One would be that Erwin would remove the validation to um, that you could only have one, or we would update the validation for duplicates of a capability. So we would evaluate based on the CTID, the capability type, and the endorsement. So you couldn't have two firefighter type two AHs, you, but you could have a firefighter type two AH and W and RX as right. long as those are all unique. Um, and the second part, it seems to me, based on just how we have, like California, their all hazard is higher than. There, or like it, it, the tiers are different federally than in the state. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it seems like we probably wouldn't implement validation necessarily in Irwin for this part, but I think this is more for the rostering folks to be able to provide the right qualification. For experience. Yes. Um, okay. So it because, and yeah, because there are discrepancies or not discrepancies, but just differences in how people do business, that this probably would be more on um, the systems to just offer that up. And then also if there's a need to override a situation where, you know, this person needs to go out, even though it's a, this type of fire and they only have this type of qualification to go out and, and do that. So we wouldn't stop the business, but this needs would to have to be mind. implemented probably yeah. That's more of a lift for our, our resource ordering and, and CAD systems who want to roster. It's almost like we have, a, have to have a crosswalk depending on what agency they're from. If they're state, their hierarchy is all hazard. If they're federal, their hierarchy is well done fire. Why? Well, that's what I'm asking, do we? I don't think so. And, and I was confused when I saw this up here because this is incident types. It is incident it has types. Nothing and I, to do and with I obviously pivoted. Gotcha. Endorsement yeah. types because I would look for NSA um, all hazard firefighter one or LE firefighter one. And that's not a good example. Yeah. Wildfire. Um, I, I think we went here though because it had to do with what the dispatcher would see when they queried to fill a request. So in order to yes. query for the right endorsement type, you needed to know what the incident type was 
And if the incident type was all risk, all hazard, versus wildfire, we didn't want him to see Keith Smith, task force leader, twice, and they'd have to be like, well, which one do we pick? Yeah, so, so that they, they get wanted the right uh, experience for the right yes. fire for that right. Well, if you, we, it would be a bad interface. Yes, sorry. It it would be it would be a bad interface, right? It would it would be not ideal because I don't know, and I'd flip a coin and be like, I'll take the top one, right? And and because it's not presented to them, we wanted to make it so that it was presented to them in a way that was reflective of. The experience based on the endorsement. So that's why that that piece is is salt is the solutioning part on the well, the resource ordering system, right, Julie? It's not. I don't think it's as cut and dry as that. Oh man! No, I'm sorry. <laughs> because you can have a wildfire incident that will have an all hazard component. So you will have law enforcement or somebody like that doing highway closures. So for the system to solve it, they need to know exactly those things. I'm looking at IROC because they're the ones impacted on this more than more than Irwin for sure. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, there, yeah, there's a small piece on our side, but yeah, I guess it's more of like, is this a user training component? If the I don't think is well so. Or I, I'm, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how, how, how they would really do business. It's the qualification. Mostly for the federal users. Because state users, I'm looking at Tim. Who just walked in. They understand <laughs> all the different different uh, requirements for different, so they know already. I, I go back to my answer. If I had to go to class for an additional day to get the all hazard box checked. Yeah. So there should be a certification of some kind. So all this is a priority, right? Like you made it very clear, this is a big deal and we need to get it in. But I think we're missing some information for IROC to be able to implement. And I, please, I don't want to talk for yeah, you. Right yeah. Now, just show what calls and endorsement types they have. So it just puts it back on the dispatcher to flip a coin and pick the right one. Education? So yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm not. I, I, I'm not uh, in that committee that changes its name every year. Um, the committee of, I, I don't know what called anymore. Is it NIMSIC? The the oh, Gina. Gina's the chair. I know. I know. <laughs> She's, She's, happy about it. She's super happy about it. She missed a call and they made her the chair. <laughs> they change the name every year, so I never know what the current one is. But, um, so like um, RX is a big, because we're, we're heavily looking at fuels and fuels information and data and integration. And so you've got prescribed fire. And those qualifications, they're trying to work on requirements for those qualifications that do prescribe fire. And they're just slightly different than well. They have a different component. And so we need to identify those. And we, that committee. When we send somebody <laughs> out and they're mobilized, we yeah. need to know which one are the NRX or are they a WF. That's why we we had the incident type tie, right, Julie? Yeah. That's and this was because we that was the only avenue we knew to approach this from. But if there is well, those, those some three. documentation somewhere that could help the process, and again, I, it's I don't it's not really an or anything. Yeah. yeah, it's just more of like how does we, the, yeah we, yeah how do we. I think Irwin, as far as that is, they just store the values that are capable. It's more of the software side, like I yeah, or we, those. We, and we're allowing you to do whatever you need to do. Other yeah. capture that data to the user. Yeah. And I, I apologize. I just stuff have to deal with a personnel issue, but um, if I, I'm, I'm going back in my way back machine here, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So. Pretty sure everybody can hear me. It's I think it's harder for the folks in the line. field, yeah, or in the on the line. Um, th there's two questions that I have here um, that I know we talked about in the past. I don't know if we've got any resolution to them or not. But I, the first one is um, 
have we received direction on how we are supposed to implement this system? That's what we're asking for. Um, yeah. Number one and number two, I back to the statement I made when I walked back in, is I, I think that there's confusion between FEMA, NWCG, and the states as to what the definition of all hazard means in comparison to wildfire, I think everybody's in agreement with prescribed fire, but yeah. I, that all hazard aspect of, is it at the top of the food chain or is it in the middle of the food chain? Right. Um, and in, in order for us to be able to appropriately answer right. this dilemma, we need to have the answer to those two questions. Absolutely. Well, and so you missed it. So Keith, Keith sort of articulated some of the some of the history behind it, and so I don't I don't want him to have to to redo it, but I thought that was really valuable for me just to hear it in that context. Because like yeah, <laughs> I figured because um, I I hadn't really heard it in that context before, but it's the reason why we're chasing our tail. That's the feeling we have a little bit on this one. Um, is go, Julie. Oh, we'll totally agree. Yeah. Right. Anything and, resource and I ordering. Think, I think this maybe even came from like the Wildcat said in the house too, because they were really concerned about what they were displaying to their users, and making sure they were yeah. making the right decisions. So I think there's two ways of looking at this. One is, is this going to be incident driven? Like the type of incident, all hazard, whatever drives what endorsement can fill. Or are we going to mix and match? Could be any support incident, but this specific request, right? I want a diver that has this endorsement. So do you think it's almost even on that request where you have to say? You know, to I think them? you're going to have to. I think you need to put it on the request because I think that helps us feel better. I mean, I think it'll be more obvious then. So currently, the the cabs that are integrating. Um, they're, they're all associated with with a parent resource, right? And so those individual parent resources would almost need to present that flag as well. But I, we're, we're not going to be I, as I, when we talk about endorsements. Endorsements are only overhead related, so it's not like we're going to carry an endorsement. Not necessarily, though. Wow. That's a boat. I don't think every agency feels that way. Okay. I would say there, I, I, I have not seen any standards yeah, defined yeah. anywhere that say uh, an engine is all. Well, I'm thinking of boats. Um, I'm thinking boats too. That yeah, was what came yeah, to my mind too. Yeah, and and uh, groups like yeah. uh, well, teams, teams mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the rubble teams so, or whatever. I mean, I get what you're saying. It is primarily overhead, but uh, but no, the I, same I thing that applies that. though. If you had a check mark on the request that required a specific endorsement, the person receiving that request. And also the system can drive what fills it. And, but we would need the training as the community that builds those to know how to a, do it. Yeah. There's an action that has to be taken on that. There's an action that has but to be taken. It seems like that might be a little bit more simple than some of the other automated ways. Yeah, probably. Well, so, and, and that's just saying, if we have a default. <laughs> I'm leaving it to you. <laughs> if we had a default in the systems and said, um, all or whatever is the default, and then we could be specific if we need to in this request. Because I now I'm just thinking right. as for the dispatchers, oh damn it, that's one more field exactly. I have to cope with. Well, I'm just thinking about our current default where everything is, is a wildfire and we've got all these supports coming in as wildfires, not working yeah. quite as hoped, right? Yeah. Uh, BJ has his hand up or did? Yeah, he still does. Yeah, uh, I guess a little tough to hear the entire conversation, but I guess the question I would have, right, wrong, or indifferent, are we kind of somehow getting into the weeds? Kind of. A, a little bit, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of looking to Keith to maybe chime in here, but you know, from my perspective, if I have 
a wildfire that I grab an all hazard task force leader and put them on the wildfire, they still should get credit for that incident and vice versa. If we have a wildfire task force leader that is filling sandbags and managing a flood, uh, uh, part of a division on a flood, they should still get credit for that incident. Um, and I do understand there are certain kinds of incidents that probably do have specialty at the higher level of that incident management, but, um, or, or specifics, you know, I think in the wildfire arena, prior to having a structure protection group supervisor, you know, that's, that's a division, right? Before we created that structure protection qual. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have any structure protection specialists on a team or whatever, what are we going to do? We're going to throw a division group supervisor there and they're going to get credit for it. So I'm hearing I, a lot of complexity that maybe needs to sift out a little bit is, is yeah. my opinion. But. No, I, I mean, definitely hear what you're saying. I think the complexity, though, because the application has to figure out how to code for it and and to success to set their users up for success. Right. So I, th I think you're. I think you're, you're right. And like when I, my first call on this, I was like, no problem. <laughs> and and then the more we peel back the onion, I'm like, oh, wait. And and, and I look with folks, I'm looking at at least because, you know, having to try to figure out how to develop for this. Well, I think some of the complexity comes from, too, the qualifications for all hazard of what you need to have that fall versus what you need in wildland fire could differ. And so you might not be able to just be a divs on all hazard because you don't have all of the qualifications, right? So I don't think it is simple. Yeah, really and, and we do probably throw the division on there, but Gina tells a story too about, you know, when she was at the pile or wherever, you know, some sort of, uh, oh, I think oil spills, et cetera. The list kind of goes on and on and on with, with folks who, sh who had that qualification, they showed up on the incident and they realized what it was and they're like, get me out of here. This is not, what I've been trained for in my in my uh, clearly not you know municipal the fire fire department type folks who who have had that training but that that wildfire experience that really doesn't translate yeah I guess just to expand a little bit I and I'm doing a way back machine now too um mm -hmm. in Minnesota we have done a bunch of all hazard stuff oil spills floods tornadoes um, I, I do think there are certain things, you know, structure collapse, definitely don't want to be anywhere there, in there other than to support those SAR teams and that type of thing. Um, but when we've brought all hazard teams that are very experienced from the Twin Cities that do have those skills, one of the things that we would do if we're going to give them a wildfire is we also assign an, a wildfire operations section chief, and then we call it good all thumbs up. Um, and so that ops chief works with the IC um, to manage everything else. But, you know, that two cents kind of way back machine. But so I think um, I mean, we we can talk about this more, but I think that part of the challenge is that, we did, that, we're, that we're missing some of the folks that we need to be engaging with. So I. I think that probably Cole and I need to uh, coordinate with the incident qualification committee. The position naming board doesn't change the names, but this parent committee, whose name has changed a couple of times. Um, so I, I think that we can work with Marlene and get something set up and like have some conversations with them. I, they they probably haven't been thinking about this from a data management perspective, and we just need to sit down and say, look, this is. We're trying to figure out how to support you, yep. but um, but you need to help us understand that. And so we can take that on within the end of the CG environment, do some of that coordination, see if we can't get some better sense of um, how we might be able to define and describe this from a data perspective. Could you could you include though, like, yes. like Julie, on that so that she can yes. right, she can be formulating concerns during that. 
Yeah, so so Keith, and so I'm saying it out loud because we're recording this, so I can go back and remember for sure what I said. <laughs> so we'll make sure Keith and Julie are part of that conversation. And, and anybody else that Marley, can relate to you and Marley, from an urban perspective, Marley, Hellfire. Tim, okay. I, I, you'll represent IQCS, but if there's anybody else, like Rose, right, that you might want on it. Yeah, I think, um, so let, you know, if you're interested in being part of the conversation, shoot Cole and I a note and we'll make sure that we kind of can coordinate on that. But, um, but I just think they, you know, they probably have some answers or they have some ideas or, or we can at least make them start thinking about it from a data perspective yeah. that, because they probably just didn't make that connection. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did see Elizabeth Gordon's hand up earlier, but she took it down, so I don't know if she still had a question. Or she found her answer. Maybe. Oh, uh, that's pretty much answered the uh, or asked the question I had, which was related to making it a request level type thing. But we're we're still trying to figure out. Um, yeah, it's, it sounds like you know there's there's some burden on the user or or on the system here as far as how do you know which endorsement to use. Well, so we're, we're still kind of stuck, I guess, on that, on, you know, how how would we implement that in a system? Right. Right. And if we're having trouble defining that here right now, how, how do we explain it to the users? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's the, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, but I, I like I like the, the path forward. I think that's the right path forward because they might have that information that we don't have that we've been trying to develop as as the as the non appropriate party to develop it. And yeah. Okay. It sounds like we're gonna keep this on for version nine, but you know, depending yeah. on how those conversations go, maybe we'll, we'll see what happens. That's that's what was gonna be my next so, question is like, you know, if this gets too complicated and it takes too long. You know, yeah. is it critical version nine? What are they? So this is Julie just pointed out. This is three years. I think that we've been having this conversation, and and so I think that with you two leaning in, that will really help, and that getting the right people at the table, and and keep in mind all that stuff that we talked about earlier on those highest that we could have the plan out to you in June. We need those conversations before that, so there's some urgency, so that we can. Keep moving forward. So we have the, we're dependent on 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 those yeah. calls. And yeah. Karen, just to clarify, it's longer than three. I started having these conversations in 2011. In 2011. He was sitting behind you, Gina, going, "We need Gina on these conversations." We I mean, started it back then. <laughs> yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. It's, it's been a long time. And it, I guess here's the thing. <laughs> we have been. We have been operating without this in place, but not well. <laughs> and so it is it is important. And yes, you've been very gracious with not getting them done and being when it didn't get put in V8, right? Okay, but I really need it in V9. And that's why he called me right away. He said, I need this in there. So just I want to put a plug so in for you. As Gina eloquently said, 2011, I think it was before that. Yeah, it was. It was. So, um, <laughs> And I blame his dad for bringing that all out. I, I, was, I, mean, I heard you call him yeah. yeah. So, depending upon the emphasis in the all in that FEMA world, is how critical it is. It, that the pressure of doing that, and the requirements of doing that, goes up and then it comes down, right? I don't know where it's at right now. But newer conversations are happening again. So, it might go back up. The things. So there's not good definitions and all task books for some of the others. There are some additional work that they do for prescribed fire that could qualify as that. That's one of the things the committee needs to do is if there's a different prescribed fire task book required for a firefighter one or whatever, they need to make sure that's developed. Included in it. So that's, well, the, that's the first part. Deb is, this is, Deb's been leaning in on this, right? This is one of the projects that she brought, they brought her back out of retirement mm -hmm. for, right? At least that's who's been sure. contacting Julie and I. Sure. Yeah, uh, so to me, it's, it's an NWCG priority as well. I, I agree. So, um, but, but as we're moving forward, I, as if FEMA decides to really do this full blown, 
we need to position people. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, we're good with that. You've got all the notes you need on that. Yeah. Exactly. That sounds like the next steps are going to show and Cole are going to lean in and start talking about those. And we'll, we'll all get an invite here next yeah. week. Um, okay. So now we're moving on to the WFTIS. The, where, did they join us? Oh, it's 5 2. Sorry. I was, thinking, I was thinking I could sneak this one in. I was thinking, actually, this one's going to be really quick, Beth. I think we can actually get this done. And Morgan is on. And Morgan is on. So um, I, I, this is something that was that was supposed to be V9, um, or sorry, V8. And uh, this fire management complexity, instant complexity level, organizational assessment, data elements um, that they've had to do some coding behind the scenes that they continue to have to do for this version. We're bringing in its new data element for Irwin on this one. We're getting the standard Gabriella for the incident complexity level. And then there's the 209 piece on block 11. Let's just say that we're right when we say thank you. Um, block 10, where they were, were because it wasn't available in Irwin, they the closest thing that they could get for that value was fire management complexity, which is the highest and not the current. The intent of that document is the current. And so we've got everything in line and, and to, to move forward with that. I don't think we have any unanswered business questions on that. I think it's mostly the, it's the standard. Which is up for review until next Thursday. Yeah, so I was thinking it was super close. Check. I, I think Good. also it's an awareness of folks who do use that data element. I think fire response is that data element too. So, so we need to keep it. Yeah, we're not going to get rid of. Thank you. Good. She's, she always brings this up. She's like, did they, they use it? Yes. So the fire management complexity is a data element that is shared from fire response accurately. Do you derive it? Yes. And that's the current. They use it as the current. No, they use it as the as the highest complexity. Mm -hmm. Or the highest complexity. They use it appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we're going to talk about this later. Are we going to talk about the ADS associated yeah. with that? Okay. Yeah. Because we'll have to ingest that. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and do you right now? From no. Okay. So that's exciting. Yeah. Ooh. See, that's ending on a seat. Look, Beth, I'm done. <laughs> I figured we, we knew this one was going to be a quick yes we we know it. and Morgan or anybody else from WFTS that's on that's on the line I know I just did the cliff notes version on that one but that's 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 right up there at the top of the list too okay sounds great perfect okay so